This is Audible. Belinda presents this unabridged recording of The First Bird, Episode 3, Terminal Stage. Written by Greg Beck and read by Sean Mangan. Maddie stroked Baloo's long white fur from his head all the way down to his tail. The cat hadn't been itself for days. It was probably like the rest of the family, sick and tired of being locked in the house. Daddy went out by himself now. No one else was allowed. They only ate food from tins and the occasional lemon from the backyard. Mommy had to put a lot of sugar on them as they were really sour. Maddie hated them. She would have given anything for a blackberry juice papa. The cat was agitated on her lap, continually moving, scratching, and pulling at itself. Yuck! Maddie held up her hand, flicking her fingers to remove the fur sticking to them. Baloo, you're shedding. You're going to get into trouble if you make the sofa all hairy again. She watched the cat tug at itself, working the itch. And you probably have fleas as well. She shook her hand. Some of the hair refused to detach, a gummy residue gluing it to her fingers. Double yuck! She wiped it on her leg. Maddie brightened. Would you like a bath? She turned the cat around on her lap and looked into its face. That will make you smell better as well. The cat groaned and licked itself, its mouth working overtime to expel the copious amounts of hair sticking to its rasp-like tongue. It stopped and seemed to rest, its golden eyes staring up at her. Maddie took this as a sign of assent and got to her feet, placing the cat on the ground, where it lay like a sagging balloon. Well, don't you go away, Miss Lulu. I'll be right back. Maddie knew where her old baby bath was, and also her berry shampoo. It'd be perfect. She maneuvered her six-year-old body through the disheveled house, scratching at her own itches as she went. Daddy went out a lot, and Mommy didn't get out of bed much anymore. She took sleepy tablets all the time because she hated the itch, she said. Maddie scratched again, turning to speak over her shoulder. And I think you've given me fleas now as well. Maddie went into the garage and looked under the bench. The bath was still there, with a few of Daddy's tools in it. She could take them out if she was careful. Reaching forward, her arm tingled, and she noticed small round lumps on the skin. She pulled her arm back and stood up, squinting down at the fingertip-sized blisters. She pressed gently against one. It didn't hurt. She pressed again a little harder. It burst and then lay flat against her skin. Nothing icky came out, so she ignored it. Probably Baloo's fleas. She should have a bath as well. Maybe they both could have one together. She liked baths, and cats liked water too, didn't they? She wondered where Daddy was, and tried to remember exactly when it was that he went out. She was sure he'd gone out looking for food, but it felt like a long time ago now. She reached under the bench for the baby bath. First things first, she thought. Dr. Francis Hugh Hewson paced in the small laboratory. He'd been wearing the sealed suit for so long, the high-density polyethylene material was chafing his skin raw. The inner lining of his nose was scabbing, and his lips were chapped and split from the dry air that circulated within the self-contained mobile unit. Hugh licked his lips as his stomach grumbled. He was learning to go hours without food and water. The time it took, having to go through the double decon chambers, first the air blast followed by chemical misting, and then the ultraviolets, before exiting, 
only to then have to worm his way out of the rear flap of the heavy suit, made the few sips of fluid through a long straw far from worth it. The amount of time lost was enough to make him swallow down his hunger with a scratchy, dry throat. He needed answers fast, so he needed to work. He went to the computer and started typing up his latest results. Thankfully, the board had given up pressuring him for answers, preferring to simply log in and check the notes that he posted every three to six hours. Realistically, there was nothing to report beyond what they already knew. Harsh insecticides and chemical baths worked. Ultraviolet light worked. Many more chemical compounds also killed Sarcoptes scabii primus. And DDT worked best of all for a quick takedown. But the real problem was the same one that always manifested when treating viruses. Killing a virus was easy, that is, when they were free-range. However, for the most part, viruses tended to hide inside cell walls, where they did the most damage to their host. To kill them there, you had to kill the cell itself. Not ideal for the human body. The same issue arose when attempting to treat an infestation of the mite. The little monster was a burrower, and no matter how effective the external treatments, it needed to be applied directly to the skin. So far, the best-case scenario for individuals who were freed of both the living mites and their eggs was nausea, skin rashes, and respiratory problems. The short-term worst-case scenario was the risk of cancers developing. The long-term, absolute worst case was that chemical derivates turned out to be significant mutagens and destabilized human DNA for generations. What was the point of living today if it meant you rendered the population infertile or worse, gave them a 90% chance of severe birth defects for the next hundred years? Hugh snorted. The greener politicians had stopped talking about the debilitating effects to the water table or DDT residues turning up in the fatty deposits of whales. Any treatment was expected to be a potential hammer blow to the environment. But it was funny how pragmatism won out when the life in danger turned out to be their own. Hugh stood back and folded his arms within the bulky suit. He looked at the image of Scabii Primus, magnified on the computer screen. It was every horror writer's dream, or nightmare. A bulbous body with a chitinous coat and eight powerful legs, six of which ended in curved hooks, perfect for clinging to both hair and skin. The two legs near the head were smaller and sharper, looking like a combination of machete and chainsaw, used primarily for opening and then burrowing beneath the epidermal layers. But it was the thing's small head that was truly repulsive. Tear-shaped, with mandibles like twin buzzsaw blades, it was perfectly designed for what it needed to do, cut and eat its way into the skin, and then, once there, simply keep on eating. He shouldn't have been surprised that it was proving so formidable. This thing once fed on dinosaurs, so humans must have been a piece of cake, literally. Hugh sighed in the heavy suit and pulled up some maps of the American contamination shockwave. Color-coded rings representing the infestation spread out from several original points of contact. The airport, the lecture theater in Santa Barbara University, and the Orange County quarantine facility. Now, rings covered 75% of the continent. The spread was slower within the colder climates, and there were a few oases here and there, slightly slowing the spread. He hit a few keys, bringing up a spread projection. 90% coverage of the United States in another week. He updated again, this time to see the global perspective. The shockwave started at the international airports, and rapidly ate up their respective countries. The projection analytics gave the world just 90 days. Hugh closed his red, gritty eyes for a few seconds, wanting to blank out the images before him. 
In a matter of weeks, the world had been made a different place. Borders had been closed, and no international traffic was allowed. This was by order of the United Nations, and was being enforced by each country's respective military. A limited martial law was already in practice. Limited because venturing out meant doing so in a hazmat suit, and they were fast running out of those, as production of most goods and services had ceased. He wondered what would come next. Chaos, he guessed. He turned away from the screen, his shoulders slumping. So promising, so brilliant, so astute, and so out of ideas. He felt about as dumb as dirt. He licked his dry lips again and was contemplating a short break when a series of pings emanated from his computer. He frowned. The scientist, along with the hundreds of other laboratories working on a solution, had been afforded an enormous amount of seniority and clearance. No request was too great. One of the first things he had asked for was a standing order for all international ports to be on alert for news of Dr. Carla Nero. Like a flashbulb in his brain, Hugh's tired memory lit up scraps of information. The alert had kicked in. Somewhere, someone had seen, heard from, or knew something about the whereabouts of his boss. Connect. Yes? No? He fell against the computer and hit the large square flaring on the screen. Yes. Immediately, Hugh was routed through to an incoming plane. Please be on it. Please be on it, he whispered as the pilot answered. Dr. Carla Nero, is she there? Put her on, please, put her on. This is an emergency. Chapter 21 Carla, thank God. What happened? Were you successful? Is everyone safe? How was Steinberg? I hope he doesn't think he's bringing another one of those goddamn birds in here. He'll be shot. Hugh took a deep breath, realizing he was talking as fast as his heart was beating. Calm down, Hugh. Too much has happened for me to answer all your questions now. I think I've got something here, a tincture. I believe it inhibits the growth and hyperaggression of the mite. In large doses, it may even eradicate them. Side effects? No idea. All our equipment was destroyed, so my evidence is line of sight only. Empirical, but not confirmed. Now tell me quickly, what is the infestation status? What does the epicurve look like? Hugh quickly brought up the screen, already knowing it was useless. The epidemic tracking curve, or epicurve for short, showed the progression of an outbreak over time. Normally they were either a bar chart or a line curve that had the standard bell shape describing progression. Outbreak, escalation, intervention, management, reduction. However, the mite infestation graph was just a straight line, shooting up at an angle of about 75 degrees. It had overrun meaningful statistics within a week. Off the chart, the data overwhelmed the statistical analysis, rendering the graph outdated even before it was complete. It simply keeps progressing at a geometric rate. Hugh sucked in a huge breath, wondering where to start. He shook his head. Like Carla, he had too much to say. He settled for a few words. It's bad, worse than bad, and what we feared. They've gone airborne like a plague. The mite eggs micro-disperse. They're nanoscopic and can be carried on the slightest breeze for miles. He paused, compressing his lips, forcing the words out. We've got nothing. He blinked making a conscious effort to rouse himself from his depression, concern for Carla overriding his own problems. Carla, you've got to be careful. Things are... different. Okay, Hugh, we should be at LAX in around six hours, Carla said. No, no, you can't land here, he shot back. For God's sake, is the local quarantine going to give us a problem? We might have... No, yes, I don't know anymore... The infestation has gone global. There have been outbreaks in Spain, Italy, the United Kingdom, and we expect most majors to be affected by now. 
It's not just our nightmare anymore. Hugh sighed. The problem is the machinery has already been started, and once we call a pandemic severity five, we commence a process that rolls on by itself. Hugh snorted sadly. The borders are closed, nothing in or out. We called a pan five, and then there was an outbreak in D.C., in the White House itself. They went nuts, panicked. The president and vice president were taken to secure bunkers at opposite ends of the country. They shut the place down. No one is allowed to leave, no one is allowed to enter, and now we're under nationwide martial law. We are effectively closed for business. Hugh, for God's sake, we're in a private jet. We can come in on a short runway. Don't worry about the welcome home band. We can just... Carla, it's not that. It's... The militia's watching the airport. They'll stop you from landing or disembarking or... He swallowed, not wanting to frighten his boss, who obviously had no idea what had been occurring in the time they'd been away. The militias are mostly infested, and some of them are clearly insane. We stopped being able to deal with them ages ago. Oh, shit, she said slowly. Oh, shit is right. These protocols were planned and wargamed and computer simulated for decades, and the first time we put them into effect, guess what? We forgot one thing, the unpredictability of the human condition. People don't do as they're told. People basically don't believe the government and want to get out, to get away. He licked his dry lips. And no wonder, because those who stayed were either killed by looters or... changed. Hugh drew a breath. But how? We haven't been gone long. How did it get so bad so quickly? Hugh snorted, remembering. Fear makes people coalesce into mobs and the Internet is only too happy to feed their fear. No matter how we tried to control the information, once images started to appear showing the effects of the infestation in full, frightening, bloody color, well, what do you think happened? People shit themselves. Then their fear turned to anger, and they rioted, demanding that we do something like yesterday. His voice rose. Everyone is so scared of being infested, people are being shot on doorsteps. He was breathing like a marathon runner, the panicked pressure and pent-up stress catching up with him. Within a few days, we went from the law of the land to the law of the jungle. He drew in a few deep breaths of artificial air. It's quieter now. People don't go out. There's no real reason to. The shops were raided and it quickly became obvious that going out increased your chance of either being infested or shot. The National Guard is out, teams of very large men in blue hazmat suits riding around in sealed jeeps, shooting anything. Dogs, cats, foxes, you name it. Just animals for now, but... He let the implication hang there. He didn't want to spell out what he thought the next steps in control and management might be. Carla's voice was more exasperated than surprised. Jesus Christ, Hugh, I'm so sorry. He heard her laugh tiredly. You know, you've got to hand it to us humans. With all our sophistication and technology, we're still only one lightning strike away from savagery. Hugh lowered his head. He knew he was out of his depth. He needed help. He needed Carla here. Yeah, so, some divine assistance would be welcome right about now. He laughed softly. Anyway, forget about my day. How was yours? Carla laughed. For the first time, he heard genuine pleasure in her voice, probably relief that he was retaining his sense of humor. Oh, you know, we went down to a little bit of paradise, ate tropical fruit and swam in blue lagoons, what else do you do in the Amazon? There was silence for a few seconds before her voice grew serious. Hugh, what now? Now? Now we need you here, ASAP. We need your expertise and management. I just can't deal with everything. 
And frankly, I've hit more brick walls than I care to admit. Most importantly, we need to run tests on that solution you've got. He paused to gather his thoughts. We need to get you back to Atlanta, one way or another. You can't come into a normal airport. We can find a cleared runway close to us. There should be a safe place to set down, but that's all we can do. You'll have to come to us, I'm afraid. Can you do that? Hugh heard a muffled conversation as Carla discussed it with someone else on the plane. Sure, just give us the coordinates. And you're at CDC home base, yes? That's right, Lab 6. Hell, we've commandeered all the labs, he said. Are... are the streets clear? Safe? she asked cautiously. Yes and no. We'll organize an escort when you get to the outskirts, but there are militias out on the highways, and at night you'll need to find a safe place. It's a funny world out there. People are scared, people are hiding, people are killing themselves and each other. He breathed in deeply, feeling concern for her, but also feeling more confident than he had in weeks. Good luck and Godspeed. Same to you. See you soon, hopefully. Her voice faded out, and he lifted his head and closed his eyes. He hadn't told her everything. He couldn't, not yet. Get her here first. That was his priority. He opened his eyes and whispered to the ceiling, Please, God. Carla turned to the pilot. Did you get any of that? Some. So I guess LAX is out and we're being directed to... Where, exactly? Carla turned back to the front window. Not sure. Hugh is sending coordinates. But I know it'll be close to the CDC headquarters in Atlanta. How much extra time until we can get there? The pilot stared at her for a few seconds, before blowing air out through compressed lips. Well... It was just on five hours to L.A. We had plenty of fuel to make that, but if we have to divert across most of the continent, well, I don't think time will be the issue. Either we drop short or we find a place to refuel. He raised his eyebrows. These things can get pretty heavy when the engines stop working. The pilot turned back to the cockpit window and seemed to ruminate for a second or two. Rough down there, huh? Rough? Yeah, a perfect storm sort of rough, and we're about to fly right into it. Okay. Do me a favor, then. Ask your man if there are any refueling stations I can use. I only need about a quarter of a tank for the hop, but without that I won't make it all the way. Carla nodded, pulled the headphones down over her ears, and connected once again. As she spoke to the scientist again, the gravity of the situation became even bleaker. Okay, thanks. Hang on, Hugh. She pulled the phones off her head. He wants to know how far you can get before you're empty. The pilot looked at his dash, checking dials and computer screens, showing weather, speed, altitude, and fuel, taking them all in and calculating his best chances. Well, we've currently got a slight tailwind over the central states. If I take us up another few thousand feet, we can probably squeeze an extra few miles out of her. I think I can get us somewhere between St. Louis and Memphis, maybe a few miles farther if we're lucky. You an Elvis fan? Carla grinned. Who isn't? She passed the information on to Hugh, who was obviously relaying it on to someone else. Carla nodded, pushed one of the cups back off her ear, and turned to the pilot. Okay, he says there are plenty of smaller airports there you can use, depending on how far you get. Obviously, the closer to Atlanta, the better. She put her hand to the headphones, listening. They want to know where you think you can get to. If we can get to the city outskirts, they'll meet us and bring us in from there. The pilot looked at the control panel again, his eyes narrowing. You know, I've spent some time in Tullahoma. How would that be? 
If I can make it that far, then at least it's somewhere I'm familiar with, and it puts you about 190 miles from Atlanta. Carla nodded and pulled the headphones back over her ear. Hugh, what about Tullahoma? She waited as another conversation took place in the background. A few minutes later, Hugh came back with his reply. She turned and gave the pilot a thumbs up. Thanks, Hugh. Hopefully see you soon. She pushed the headphones back off her head. Tullahoma Regional Airport it is. You know it well? He smiled. Oh, yeah, like the back of my you-know-what. Excellent facilities, nice long smooth runway, rebuilt in 2009. It'll do just right. He turned and stuck out his hand. It's Frank, by the way, Frank Jansen. Will you guys be okay once we're down? Carla shook his outstretched hand and nodded. Carla Nero, and yep, there's a chopper going to meet us. Good job, Carla. Nice to meet you. He continued looking at her, nothing but clear blue outside, and the gentle whine of high-powered jet turbines just audible in the soundproofed cockpit. His face became serious. So, Max didn't make it, huh? I don't believe he stayed behind. He looked hard at her. Two questions. What happened, and do I need to inform the authorities and go back? Carla sat back and closed her eyes. She shook her head. He's dead, same as Jan and John Mordell. The authorities already know. Carla kept her eyes closed, not wanting him to see the lie on her face. We had nothing to do with it other than being in a place that was more dangerous than we were ready for. She opened her eyes and turned to him. There's no reason to go back. There's nothing to go back for. She sank back into the co-pilot's chair. It's over. I guess we both found what we were looking for. She shrugged. Could have been any of us, or all of us. The pilot grunted. I always thought an ex-wife would kill him, long before any old jungle. She pulled a face. Old is right. Frank continued to look at her for a few more moments. She could feel her eyelids drooping. The chair was large, and the sunlight coming in through the tinted windows and bathing her legs was like a warm blanket. She was dimly aware that Frank was speaking. Get some sleep. I'll give you a nudge in a few hours when we're getting close, he said softly. First, I need to tell, she said, slipping into sleep. I'll tell them. You rest. Carla let her eyes fully close. For the first time in ages, the world and its problems went away. The hand on her shoulder made her jump. Broken images of a creature with a hundred legs gripping her arm disappeared like smoke as the late afternoon sunlight broke through and dispelled the monsters. Carla blinked with crusty eyes. Where are we? We're a little over 200 miles out from Tullahoma, and I'm running on vapors. I've taken us inland. You can just see Memphis coming up on the right. Frank motioned toward the window. Strange. Looks like there are some pretty big fires. The smoke's dark. Burning rubber tires, maybe. Signal fires? Carla leaned forward, watching the multiple columns of dark smoke rise from the city's outskirts for several seconds, before exhaling slowly through her nose. She sat back. She knew that sort of emission. She'd seen it before in other countries dealing with major outbreaks, amongst both human populations and animals. It was the greasy, dark smoke that came from rendered flesh. Crematorium smoke, or more likely just mass burnings. Looks like we've been overwhelmed by the numbers and speed. She narrowed her eyes as she thought through the social implications. No one wanted to stand out in the open and grieve anymore. Close proximity to other humans probably represented the greatest risk to life. So quick, she thought. 
They always expected that if something like this occurred, it would be via a natural or bioengineered microorganism, not some sort of primordial parasite. Thirty minutes out from landing and there's no one answering from the tower. I sure hope we don't have to circle. You're welcome to stay up here with me, or do you want to join your friends? Carla was snapped from her reverie. She leaned across to grasp the pilot's arm. Thanks, Frank, but I'll give everyone a heads up about what we're about to go into. Okie dokie, I'm going to try the tower again. See you on the tarmac. Carla rose and threaded her way back to her seat. Matt was snoring under a blanket. Megan watched her come down the aisle. Yope nodded to her, and Kurt just fiddled with something in his bag. She took the seat in front of Matt and Megan and half-turned. We're landing in thirty minutes. Better wake Sleeping Beauty. We need to talk about what happens next. Megan simply elbowed Matt, waking him mid-snore. What is it? She nodded toward the CDC woman. Carla wants to talk. Carla half knelt on her seat, raising herself so they could all see and hear her. By now, you all know we're not touching down in L.A. We'll be landing in Tullahoma, about 190 miles northwest of Atlanta, where I need to get to. She paused, looking at each of them. Three pairs of eyes stared back. Kurt continued to rummage. Let me lay it out for you. It's a... She gave up trying to sugarcoat it. It's all gone to shit. The infestation is now countrywide and there is significant danger. Martial law is being enforced, and I need to get my sample to Atlanta as a priority. That overrides everything else. How will you get to Atlanta from Tullahoma? Matt asked. There's a chopper coming for me. You're all welcome to come, and to be brutally honest, it'll be a lot safer for you, Carla responded. Yope cleared his throat. My family is in New York. I need to get back to them. That is my priority. I'm sorry. Second that, I got a cabin on the outskirts. I'll tag along with Yope. Kurt winked at Yope, who nodded back, obviously pleased with the idea of company. Matt turned to Megan. Atlanta is only a few hundred miles from Asheville. Maybe we can hop a ride and then keep on going when it's safe. Megan raised her eyebrows and nodded. Carla looked at each of them. Okay, we'll see what it looks like when we're on the ground. From what my people have been telling me, traveling unaccompanied is not a good idea right now. In fact, it might be deadly. Take your seats and strap in, folks. I'm making my approach. The pilot's voice had the laid-back tone that pilots were renowned for, cool and calm and unflappable. Masnero, can you please join me? Suddenly there was an edge to his voice. Carla tried to keep her face serene as she rose, conscious of everyone watching her. The knots in her stomach started to tie themselves ever tighter. She closed the small door behind her. What is it, Frank? The pilot's face betrayed nothing, but the edge of concern in his voice gave him away. I still can't raise anyone in the tower. There should be a dozen people there. Carla strapped in and leaned forward, looking out at the approaching runway. Power blackout, maybe? Frank shook his head. Airports have their own backup generators. Tullahoma is no backwater. It's a city with half a million people. Nothing's moving down there. I tell you, something is very wrong. The plane continued its descent, and the pilot eased back a little. There's smoke over the runway. Worse, there's fire and debris on the tarmac itself. Can we still land? Carla saw several fires on the runway, some large, some small. Lady, we have to land. He took off his sunglasses. And yes, I think so. This bus doesn't need a long strip. The plane came around slowly and lined up with the stripes down the runway's center. 
It was clearer now what was burning. Planes larger than their own had been reduced to skeletal bonfires. Luckily, most were pushed to the side. Frank came down softly, the wheels just kissing the runway, before he immediately used the craft's port and starboard navigation flaps to gently ease the still fast-moving bird past or around the biggest obstacles. After a few more minutes, he eased back and used the remaining thrust to roll toward the terminal. Weird, Carla said in a hushed tone. The tower was dark. In fact, the entire airport was dead and dark. The silence and desolation was total. Broken windows, abandoned suitcases, and the odd piece of paper lifting off to float across the outfield. Weird is right. Frank unleashed his belt and leaned forward, looking around the intersecting runways. Large and small fires dotted the edges and spread into the surrounding fields. Where's your chopper? I thought you said they'd be here when we arrived. Maybe we're early. Carla was confused by their non-appearance. If they only had to come from Atlanta, they should have been there with hours to spare. Maybe. Frank continued to taxi in slowly, staring intently through the window and barely breathing. Suddenly, the cockpit door burst open. Jesus, man, you want to give a guy a heart attack? Frank shook his head, continuing to stare intently through the windscreen. Sorry. Matt got down beside them, looking out at the deserted airport. Looks like a war zone. What happened here? As they rolled in closer to the terminal, they could see a banner hanging on the front of the wedding cake-shaped building. Two large words were written on it in dripping red paint. Go home. Wow. Now that's a welcome the Founding Fathers would have struggled to come up with. Frank brought the plane to a halt, letting the turbines wind down to silence. Oh, God. Please, no. Carla brought her fist down on her knee as she spotted another craft burning. That's... Oh, no, Carla. Even to Matt, the markings were familiar. On one of the still distinguishable panels, a large blue square containing the white CDC logo was buckling. Within the frame of the cockpit, a blackened skeleton could be made out, its head thrown back, blackened jaws hanging open. A few feet away, another body lay sprawled on the tarmac, this one unburnt. What the fuck is going on here? Frank's calm exterior had finally been punctured. He unlashed his seatbelt and got to his feet. There's a man down there, maybe dead. I'm going to take a look. He paused, his lips tight, and opened a small locker at his feet, drawing forth a first aid box. Stay here. He elbowed Matt out of the way and rushed along the galley toward the exit door. Frank, wait! Carla leapt after him, followed by Matt. Frank unlatched the door and engaged the gangway lowering mechanism. In a few moments, the stairs and railing had unfolded. He poked his head out and looked around. Matt grabbed at his shirt. Let's wait until we have some idea of what we're dealing with, okay? Frank looked back at Matt, his face stony with determination. And if that was you or your girlfriend or Carla lying on that tarmac, son, would you want me to wait? He dislodged Matt's hand and started down the steps. Carla went to follow him, but Matt grabbed her and held her back. Megan and Yope joined them at the door, while Kurt watched through his porthole window. As the pilot walked cautiously across the tarmac, Carla, Matt, Megan, and Yope walked partway down the gangway, each taking up a position on a different step and hanging on to the person in front. Careful, Frank. Carla's call was hushed. He turned and nodded briefly, and then continued to walk hunched and crab-like, his head turning left and right. The windows of the terminal remained dark and inhospitable. 
Some were smashed, the glass on the ground below, testament to the impact from inside the building. There was the sound of something flapping from behind the row of hangars, and the pop and crackle of burning plastic from the fires. But beyond these noises there was nothing. No car horns, moving vehicles, or shouts from busy workers, or even bird calls as the day came to a close. Frank was close to the fallen man now, and he eased to a stop, his head whipping quickly left and right, either nerves or intuition urging caution. Matt turned briefly to the terminal. The dark windows seemed to watch them, frowning with displeasure at the intrusion. He jolted. There was something there, a quick movement. What the? What was it? Carla was below him on the steps. She turned quickly, saw where he was looking, and followed his gaze. After a second, she turned back to him. What was it? What did you see? Matt frowned and stared hard at the broken windows. It was gone now, but he was sure there had been a quick hint of movement on the top floor. Just his imagination? Maybe nothing. I thought there was someone at the window. Yop was highest on the steps, at the plane door, and was craning his neck. There's nothing there now. Carla turned back to where the pilot was nearing the body. We'll need to check it out later. She cupped her hands around her mouth and called again to Frank. Be careful! Frank half-turned and waved, and then quickly knelt beside the body. He reached down and placed a hand on the side of its neck, then immediately withdrew it as if burned and turned back to the plane. He swiped his hand across his neck and slowly got back to his feet. The crack of a rifle made them all jump as it tore a hole in the silence and then bounced away. Collectively, they snapped around to stare at the terminal for a split second before whipping back to Frank. The man fell like a tree a fountain of blood shooting from one side of his head. Frank! Carla went to charge down the steps, but the rifle came again, and a thump beside their heads left a single, finger-sized hole in the steel of the plane's outer skin. Back inside! Back inside! We're under fire! Matt pulled Carla back, and Megan fell inside onto Yope, who tumbled backward. Matt hauled Carla inside the doorframe just as another shot rang out. This one was better aimed and carved a divot in the flooring beside Yope's head. Scheiße! The evolutionary biologist rolled and scrambled away. Get down! Matt dove to the floor on top of Megan, Carla landing beside him. More shots drummed metallically against the outside of the aircraft. Kurt's voice drifted up from the back of the plane. I'm thinking the go-home message was something they expected us to pay attention to. He walked calmly forward, reached around the doorframe, grabbed the heavy door and pulled it shut. The airtight oval closed with a soft hiss. Carla sat up. We have to try and help him. Kurt shook his head. Nope, he's dead just like anyone else who steps outside will be. Carla put her hands over her eyes and rubbed hard. No, no, no! What the hell is happening? Chaos, I think, Kurt said simply. She looked at him with red eyes. We've landed right in a hornet's nest. Carla crawled toward the cockpit. I'm going to call the CDC. I've got to tell them about their pilots, and see if they can help us out of this mess. Kurt pressed a button beside the door, and a soft whine told them the stairs were retracting back into the underside of the craft. No use leaving out the welcoming, Matt. Matt sat up and rested his elbows on his knees. Thanks. At least we're safe for now. Don't thank me yet. Those reports were from a high-powered rifle, 99 caliber or better. Smaller caliber will be deflected, but those bigger bullets will pass right through the side of the plane, through you, and then keep going out the other side, fast enough to kill someone else. 
All shutting the door did was make it difficult for whoever is out there to pick us off with their sniper scope, but they can still hit us. He looked over his shoulder at the door. Best we stay low and away from the windows. Matt leaned toward the cockpit and repeated Kurt's instructions to Carla. Got it, she replied. Yope climbed into one of the seats, but stayed hunched over. So now we wait, hmm? For what? Megan climbed up in the row behind him. We wait for Carla to reach the CDC and get another chopper here, I guess. There's food and water for a few days, so if we stay out of sight, we'll be okay for a while. Another couple of gunshots pinged metallically on the front of the plane, the shooter having sighted Carla through the cabin window. I'm fine. Carla crawled back to them, breathing hard. No more choppers, but... Great, well, there goes plan A. Megan slumped and then sprang forward. Can anyone fly this thing? Kurt shrugged. I can fly, but just small recreational craft. But that's not the problem. Fly to where, exactly? Besides, there's no fuel for a takeoff. Megan's face turned red. To where? Are you shitting me? To any fucking where but here. You know... Carla cut her off. Cool it. There's a military unit patrolling just outside Shelbyville. They're about 35 miles up Highway 16 and being diverted to us. She smiled. They'll be here in an hour, give or take. More bullets struck the plane, front and back. Shit. Kurt spun and eased down to peer out one of the small windows. Double shit. We ain't got an hour. He quickly headed down to the rear of the plane. Matt snuck across to steal a look and immediately felt his heart sink. He eased away from the window. Here comes the welcoming committee. Megan, Yop, and Carla leapt forward and peered from the side of one of the toughened porthole windows. Matt knew what they were seeing. A ragged band of people, some in face masks, some in torn hazmat suits, some simply with T-shirts tied around their noses, as if trying to protect themselves from nothing more than a bad smell. Most had guns, but some had shovels, bats, or large pieces of broken brick. This is a nightmare. Carla sat down on one of the seats. Matt leaned over her to look again. When they said go home, they meant it. Ideas, anyone? Megan half turned. Let me ask again, can anyone else fly this fucking thing? Kurt reappeared with two revolvers. He spoke while loading one of the guns. Carla, get back onto your pal at the CDC and see where those guardsmen are. He looked up at Matt. Get over here. Kurt straightened, sucked in a breath, and then grabbed the door lever, twisted it, and pushed the heavy porthole door open. In one swift motion, he leaned out and fired several times into the crowd, then smoothly pulled the door shut. He threw the gun to Matt and pulled a box of bullets from his pocket. You're on reload. Where'd these come from? Matt fiddled with the heavy silver weapon. Kurt checked the other weapon, now in his hand. Steinberg's satin nickel-plated Colt 45s, never used until 60 seconds ago. Reload. Matt looked out the window as yells rose from outside. Many in the decrepit band had thrown themselves to the ground following Kurt's volley, but they were now getting back to their feet. Several remained prone and bleeding, attesting either to Kurt's marksmanship or his blind luck. They resumed their noisy approach, this time with more caution. Kurt turned to Matt and smiled briefly then opened the door again, this time causing panicked shouts from the mob. He did as before, his aim just as good. There was sporadic return fire, but no hits, and the crowd mostly scattered. He pulled the door shut, and he and Matt swapped weapons. Matt looked out the window again. That got their attention? Kurt snorted. For now, they'll be back, they get closer to the plane and we're all as good as dead. 
He shouted down to Carla in the cockpit. Any word on that ground support? On their way, she shouted back. Kurt looked across to Megan. The thing is, we don't need to fly the plane. We just need to get the hell away from here. So someone needs to get up there, start this tin can up, and drive it out the gates. He smiled apologetically. I'm a little busy, so you know I mean you, Megan. Go on, I'll walk you through it. She nodded, her face a mix of determination and doubt. You can do it, Megs. Get Carla to tell the CDC what we're doing so they can meet us. Unless you can drive this all the way to Atlanta, Matt said. She laughed nervously, then got down low and crawled toward the cockpit. Kurt ducked down to look out the window, then quickly turned to push the door open again. Five more shots, but only one takedown. He handed the gun to Matt for reload. Running out of time. And bullets, Matt nodded. I think there's still enough left for a few more reloads. Kurt shook his head. Doesn't matter. There's no door on the other side of the plane. As soon as this bunch of Einsteins realizes that, they'll be looking in our windows. Matt checked again and saw a mobile set of steps being pushed along the tarmac. The steps started to veer toward the rear of the plane. Their course was obvious. That didn't take long. Yep, I expect our friends will be joining us real soon, Kurt said. Matt leaned forward. Any time's good, Megs. How do I... Ah. Kurt stuck the large gun in his belt and walked quickly into the cockpit. Matt leaned around the edge of the window and watched the gathering crowd push the metal steps down the runway. More people joined in, some near naked, all armed with something. Welcome home, he said softly, as he heard Kurt hurriedly explain the controls to Megan. Stop, start, port, starboard. That's all you need to know. We don't need up or down or to learn about altitude, weather, hydraulics, or even fuel consumption. We're not taking off, and when we're out of gas, we're out. He rushed back, pulling his gun out again. Any change? Still coming, Matt replied. Okay. He turned. Now, Megan. Here goes, her reply floated back to them. There was silence for a few more seconds, and then a gentle whine could be heard coming from outside the body of the aircraft. Yope looked down past the rear of the plane. I think they're going to try to climb up on top of us. What will they do, try to break in, do you think? Maybe. Maybe just shoot down into the plane until they get lucky and hit one of us. The proverbial fish in a barrel. Kurt got close to the window and looked back along the craft to the engine. Good. Spinning now. Takes a few seconds. Steinberg had nothing but the best, and this Gulfstream has a couple of Rolls-Royce BR-710 turbofan engines with over 15,000 pounds of thrust each. In a few more seconds, the gas should kick in, and the fans will really start to spin, and then we'll get some go. He changed his angle to check on the mob. Better slow them down a tad. He pulled open the door, eliciting animal-like howls, and let go with another six rounds. He didn't have a hope of hitting anyone this time, but it was enough to make the crowd scatter. He dragged the door shut, and this time spun the locking wheel. Okay, time to make it interesting. He walked to the front of the plane and leaned in beside Megan and Carla. Matt glanced back and saw that the crowd was back with the stairs, about to disappear behind the plane. Matt got to his feet and followed Kurt into the cockpit. Kurt, they're behind us. Kurt reached forward. I got it. Hair dryer time. Hang on. He reached in front of Megan, pressed the ignition, and smoothly pushed the lever forward. A low, muscular roar came from the rear of the plane, and then there was an almighty push as the turbo-powered gas turbines sucked in, compressed, and then blasted a mix of combusted gases and superheated air out backward. The crowd pushing the stairs was blown over like leaves in a gale, most skidding down the runway as though across slippery ice, 
some lying still, flesh red and smoking, where the rush of inferno hot gases and air had bathed their exposed skin. The plane gathered speed, and he eased back on the throttle, settling into an easy ten-mile-per-hour roll down the tarmac. He stood back, leaving it to Megan. Which way? she asked, smiling at being in control of the large machine. Carla pointed. Go straight down. We need to go the length of the runway and then cross the grass verge. Should be okay, it's been dry lately. Then we need to crash through a barrier and hop onto the highway. Just pray it's not crowded with cars, broken down or otherwise. Matt looked back down at the rear side windows. The men and women who had been on the tarmac were just stirring, some getting to their feet, others lying still, smoke or steam rising from their prone bodies. None of them made any move to follow. No chasers, he said. Good, we just bought ourselves some time. That patrol better be where it's supposed to be. They were all crammed into the cockpit now, Megan and Carla seated, and Kurt, Yop, and Matt standing behind. Each offered their own advice for navigating the grass field. They bounced and rocked, and Megan pulled a face, trying to concentrate as she gave a little more thrust to compensate for some of the deeper holes. Ah, trees coming up! Megan went to change the plane's angle, but Kurt stopped her. Forget him. This baby is about ninety feet long and weighs in at seventy-five hundred pounds. Somehow, I don't think we need to be worrying about scratches right now. Just plow through them. Megan gave it a bit more thrust, and the ten-foot-high trees were pushed over or out of the way as she smashed into them. Coming to the end of the field, a wire fence was easily nosed aside. Then she maneuvered toward a gap between some shed-like buildings, losing the tips of both wings. Ouch! She jumped a curb and bounced heavily down onto the four-lane highway. Easy. She smiled as she headed down the deserted road, cruising along at about twenty miles per hour. A blinking light from the panel indicated incoming communication, and Carla pulled the headset back on and nodded. Hugh? Go ahead, I'm here. She turned. They can see us on satellite. Escort is only about ten miles out now and closing on our position. Keep a lookout. Megan snorted. I think we'll be a little hard to miss. In a few minutes, a broad green vehicle, the only one moving, could be seen roaring down the center of the desolate highway. Megan took one hand off the control column and punched the air. Captain Hannaford coming in for landing. Thank you for flying with us today. She laughed and started to ease back on the throttle, the big plane slowing and then stopping as the engines wind down to silence. She looked across at Carla. Well, that's got to be something off my bucket list. Not bad. And given some of those bumps, I think you could honestly say you even had it airborne. Carla jumped to her feet. Less than two hundred miles and we're home, sort of. Kurt pushed the door outward and lowered the steps, ducking back inside to grab his pack and heft it up onto his shoulders. Matt saw him grunt with the effort. He noticed Matt watching and winked. The one upside to the end of the world, no customs and immigration. He laughed and stepped down, followed by Yope, the rest having already grabbed what possessions they needed. Kurt stood watching the broad, aggressive-looking vehicle roar toward them. He turned to Matt. It's an ASV Guardian, I think. He watched it for a few more seconds. Yep, an M-1117 Guardian armored security vehicle. These guys are really ready for war. The vehicle pulled up alongside the group. Carla could see what appeared to be a small water cannon mounted on top. Two young soldiers stepped out and stood slightly apart. Both of them were armed, looking formidable. The red-headed one seemed to be in charge and motioned to them to stay where they were. The other, who had dark, glistening stubble on his square-shaped head, slowly scanned the surrounding countryside 
as if expecting someone else. Red spoke loudly, staring directly at Carla. Dr. Nero? Dr. Carla Nero? Carla nodded, and he stepped a little closer to her. Matt guessed he already knew exactly who he was looking for. He gave a small salute. I'm Sergeant Reed, and this, he gestured to his companion, is Corporal Metzger. It's great that you could get here, ma'am. Unfortunately, we've still got a bit to go yet. I need to take you straight to the CDC. The rest of your companions can be dropped off at the base and scheduled for relocation at a later date and time that suits. He looked at each of them. That will be a secondary priority. Matt had the feeling the soldier would have been just as happy to leave them by the side of the road. Carla wrinkled her nose. Phew, what is that you're wearing? Red responded almost mechanically. Something the lab put together. We call it DB. It's a combination of DEET and benzyl benzoate. Carla had suspected as much. DEET was short for diethyl metatoluamide. It was one of the most powerful insect repellents known, and had been since 1946. The addition of benzyl benzoate made it target-specific. It was one of the best topical treatments for burrowing scabies. Pretty tough stuff. You guys feel okay? Carla peered into the young man's eyes. Even from where Matt stood, he guessed the amount the men were wearing must have been eye-watering. Inside the vehicle, it would probably give them headaches, or worse. The young man just shrugged. You're going to have to wear it as well, or one of the sealed suits, which are pretty damn stifling in this weather. The alternative is doing nothing and getting the bugs under your skin, and that ain't too pretty. But you know that, Dr. Nero. Carla grunted softly and gave an almost imperceptible nod of her head. She knew the effects only too well. She turned to their group. So, suits or spray? Megan stepped up with her fingers over her nose and spoke in a pinched squeak. Wow, that is really rank. She turned her head away, breathed in, and then spoke again. Okay, better than a sealed suit in this heat, I think. Bathing in this once can't be that bad. Red walked back to the vehicle and lifted free a canister bottle that looked like a small fire extinguisher. He cleared his throat. Actually, in this heat, the repellent needs to be reapplied every 24 hours. Otherwise, you just sweat it off. Great. Matt stepped in close to the door of the ASV and felt the heat radiating out of the steel interior. He looked at the suits hanging on pegs inside the vehicle and shook his head. Cattle dip it is, then. He lifted his arms and turned his head. Just like getting a spray tan. Pretty much, and that's why you'll all need to strip down. The spray has got to touch the skin. He smiled flatly, his eyes on Megan. Matt noticed that Corporal Metzger had stopped scanning the countryside and now watched them, waiting for Megan to take her clothes off. If he expected shyness, he was disappointed. Megan was in her underwear in a few seconds flat, arms out. Let her rip, Ginger! The sergeant smiled and pointed the nozzle. Keep your eyes closed and hold your breath for ten seconds while I do your head, okay? She nodded and gulped in air. The spray started, and a fine mist coated Megan's face, neck, and hair. He stopped the spray. Okay, hold out your hands, palms up. I'm going to drench your hands, and then I want you to comb it through your hair. Megan did as requested. While she had her arms up, he worked his way down her body, asking her to turn slowly, like a roast on a spit. The whole process took a few minutes. On completion, he asked her to hold out her hands again. This time, after drenching them, he told her to scrub it into the places that she still had covered. She looked at Matt and pulled a face. It stung. One after the other, they followed suit, even handing over bags and backpacks so they could be doused. Kurt grabbed the canister so he could personally do the inside of his own bags, 
being a little shy about anyone seeing the contents. Together, they piled into the back of the large vehicle. It was cramped, and once the doors were closed, red lights came on, giving everyone a hellish appearance. Megan had tied a handkerchief around her face, as the air was stifling, despite an air-conditioning unit whining softly in the background. All it did was stir the chemical air around them. Other than the aircon, it was surprisingly quiet inside, more to do with the smooth roadway rather than the vehicle's heavy insulation and armor plating. Carla leaned forward. Sergeant Reed, just how bad is it getting on the ground? He turned and stared hard at her for a few seconds. Lately, hard to tell. People rarely come out anymore. Kurt snorted. They certainly came out to welcome us at the airport. The soldier made a noise in his throat and looked glum. Yep, real sorry about that. Same thing at the bigger airports. Didn't think it was happening at the smaller ones. The healthies aren't keen on planes landing anymore. Seems they blame foreigners for the infestation. Megan scoffed. That's crazy. Foreigners didn't bring this in, unless you count a primordial bird and an American biology professor. And what's with this healthies? Reed sucked in one cheek. Got a few tribes now. The uninfested or healthies are a shrinking bunch. There are also the invisibles who never come out. The heavily infested, we call them skinners. And then the most dangerous of all, the bloomers. He sighed. Dr. Hewson will fill you in. And as for who's to blame, it doesn't matter to the mob. These people don't have a conscience or a sense of logic anymore. He turned back to the front of the vehicle. We're trying to bring some sense and order, but... But you're outnumbered, Carla finished. Yep, a thousand to one. Bottom line is, we lack information. The government is trying to run a phone census... They've got computers to call people and ask them for names of occupants, number of residents, status of health. It's not precise. Some people just aren't answering, probably thinking it's just looters checking to see if there are people home. He shrugged. Streets are pretty quiet now. Carla pointed to the roof. So why the water cannon if there's no need for crowd control? Reed squinted at her for a few seconds then turned back, shaking his head. Not really a water cannon, Dr. Nero. His expression had drooped. We sure hope you guys can help. This isn't going to get better by itself. He turned to his companion. Let's pick it up, Corporal. The vehicle accelerated. Hope. Carla thought that was the best word to use. She sure hoped they could help. Well, first things first. Get us home so we can find out if we can. Matt looked over the interior of the armored vehicle. There were a couple of metal tanks along the ceiling, both marked with the triple-linked circles of the biohazard symbol struck through with a red lightning bolt. More insecticide? Sergeant Reed pushed a small send receiver into his ear. Got him. He removed it and set it down again. Carla sprang forward. That's it? Nothing else? Can we talk to some people and find out what's going on? Reed turned. Not now. This far out, I was authorized to send a three-second burst, either when I had you or knew I never would. Any more and there's a chance we'd be found. Found? What does that mean? Carla's face was a blend of confusion and annoyance. Like I said, things are different now. There are people out there who are looking to take advantage of the situation, either for political, psychological, or religious reasons. They target transmissions, especially military. It's quite easy. They use simple direction-finding techniques that have been around since World War II. Stick a few homemade receivers around the countryside and then locate the source of a transmission via triangulation, they only need six seconds. Why? Hostage-taking? Matt frowned, and the red-headed sergeant shrugged, 
and turned back to study a chart on his lap. Matt guessed the conversation was at an end. He exhaled through his nose in exasperation, just as the truck swerved and he fell against Megan. He nudged her. You okay? She snorted behind her handkerchief. Could be better. Then again, I suppose I could have stayed back home, meaning I'd either be locked indoors or skinned. So all things considered, yeah, I'm okay. He nodded. She was right. In a matter of weeks, the country had been transformed by something almost too small to be seen by the naked eye, by that and by fear. Matt grasped her knee and squeezed. She placed her hand over his and squeezed back. He looked into her eyes, still bright, and smiled. She was strong. He knew they'd make it. They had to. He turned and leaned toward the two young military men, peering out from behind the toughened glass of the armored vehicle as it roared along the vacant highway, swerving every now and then to avoid a stopped car. Do you guys see many survivors? Is that what you're doing out here? Reed looked at his companion and snorted soundlessly. He turned back to the road and shook his head. No. No, Professor Kearns. Matt waited, but nothing else came. Metzger broke the silence. Red, on your one o'clock! Matt looked out through the heavy glass. There was a mound beside the road up ahead. The ASV slowed a few hundred feet out. Bloomer, I bet, Metzger said, keeping his eyes on what looked like a pile of clothing. Reed grunted. Got it. He made a quick notation on his chart. Bring it up on my three o'clock. Reed flipped a panel on the dashboard, and an 18-inch control board lifted and was angled toward him. There were several buttons and a small joystick, which he grasped, looking at a small inbuilt monitor. He focused in on the mound, his fingers moving over the keys. From behind him, Matt could just make out the small screen changing from a standard picture feed of the mound to thermal imaging, then to something flaring blues and black, possibly showing different materials or internal densities. Warm, solid, organic mass. Confirmation on visual? Metzger drove even slower, keeping his eyes on the pile. With one hand, he lifted a small pair of field glasses. Although it was only fifty feet away, he squinted, his mouth drawing up. Okay, I can confirm a bloomer. Roger that. Ready to burn in... Matt leaned forward. What is it? Everyone behind him tried to crowd forward to see what was happening. The soldiers ignored them, and Reed continued to speak in an automatic monotone that betrayed zero emotion but plenty of training. Matt craned his neck and saw that the small screen in front of Reed now had a red bombsite target displayed directly over the mound. Reed counted down. Five, four... Three, two, burn. Reed pressed a button, and a liquid whooshing came from behind and over them. Matt's focus was drawn to a streak of red-orange that shot toward the pile on the road. The flames touched the clothing and stuck there. Matt was sure an arm rose briefly from within the giant red flower of heat, dripping material or skin from the sleeve. There was no doubt what the men were doing. Holy fuck! That was a person in there, and I think they were alive! Matt gripped the sergeant's shoulder. Reed ignored Matt's grip. He took his finger off the button as the inferno blazed. Black smoke rose in a greasy column beside the truck. He turned to Metzger. Burn complete. Move out. He twisted in his seat, his face stony. Sit back, sir. He waited until Matt had complied, then his expression eased, now more fatigued than severe. He looked from Matt to the others, who were watching intently, and then back at Matt. You asked about survivors, Professor. Well, we sure are out looking for them, but that... that wasn't one of them. They're not survivors, they're already dead. They just haven't stopped breathing. 
In fact, I think of them as more like dirty bombs. They're walking weapons, biological time bombs, who have entered, or are about to enter, a dangerous and infectious stage, which we call blooming. He turned toward Carla. Bloomers, Skinners, they haven't briefed you on any of this yet? Carla spoke softly, her voice only just audible over the revving engine. About the egg dispersal going airborne? Reed nodded. That's right. Some of the living bodies produce vesicles that disperse millions of the eggs. They're small and light enough to be carried on a breeze for miles. Our brief is to ensure that doesn't happen. But you burn them alive! Megan tried to push past Matt, but he held on to her. Alive? Not really, and not for long. Seconds, maybe, and it's painless, as the bugs have already short-circuited the body's nervous system. That way they can either eat you from the inside out or turn you into a walking hatchery. Even though your brain has been turned to mush, your body still functions, but it has been programmed to do one thing and one thing only. Carla finished for him. Produce eggs to infect more people, and then the cycle starts again. Infecting perhaps hundreds more, geometrically growing faster than we can control it. Megan slowly sat back down. Matt felt sickened, but now understood the logic behind the attacks being carried out by the young soldiers. There was silence for a few seconds. Reed looked along their faces, his own grim. This isn't a pleasant job, but these days there are a lot of unpleasant things we have to do if we are going to survive this. Carla's voice was soft. Sterilization. Reed nodded. She looked up at the tanks over her head. What are you using, thermite? Reed raised his eyebrows. Sort of. 33% jellied gasoline, 21% benzene, and 46% polystyrene with a thermite initiator. Carla closed her eyes. Napalm B. Yes, ma'am. Super napalm. Burns at 2,000 degrees, and the jelly causes it to stick to its target. There'll be nothing left but ash in a few minutes. Kurt was sitting in the rear, but his voice carried easily. I thought that stuff was banned. Reed never blinked. It is in warfare, but this isn't war. It's survival. Kurt thought about it for a few seconds and then nodded. Remind me to keep up my chemical baths, will you? He sat back. After an hour of driving in silence and several more bloomer burns, they reached a fork in the road. Kurt leaned forward from the rear. We're going through Chattanooga? I could jump out at the East Ridge Turnpike. You guys will head south, I assume, down the 75, and I can keep going on up to New York. Matt shook his head. Are you mad? Kurt ignored him. Metzger looked at Reed, and Matt could have sworn he rolled his eyes. He spoke casually over his shoulder. We'll be staying off the main roads and traveling via the smaller Tier 2 roads, less, uh, debris. Kurt tilted his head. Debris? What does that mean? I don't want to go to Atlanta. I can grab a small plane in Maryville, Johnson City, or a dozen other places and be home in a few hours. The driver glanced briefly at Kurt, and seeing his determined look, simply shrugged. You're not under arrest, and we can't force you to stay with us. I can, however, urge you to reconsider. There are armed militias out there, not to mention the infestation. I'll be crossing the country, staying low. I'm trained for that. He snorted. I'll even take some of your home brew with me and bathe in it, okay? Kurt looked at Yop. You with me? Yop stared wide-eyed for a few seconds, then shook his head, perhaps convinced by the bloomers that being outside was not a great idea right now. Kurt shrugged. Whatever. Reed didn't look unhappy with Kurt's decision. 
He spoke quietly, checking his maps again. That's fine, sir. It's your funeral... Uh, your decision. Kurt sat back, satisfied. He clutched his backpack, its weight lying heavily across his knees. Sure you know what you're doing, Kurt? I mean, is it worth it? Matt nodded to the bag. Kurt ignored him. You guys will have things sorted in a few days, a week at most. I'll be home by then. He snorted. I promise to keep my doors locked and windows closed. After all, I'll have the magic potion to keep the little fuckers away. And I'll have this. He pulled up his shirt, displaying the handguns, to keep the larger variety of pest at bay. Carla's voice was flat. You'll be safer with us. Kurt looked indifferent. Maybe. Then again, maybe a smaller group will attract less attention. His face softened. Seriously, thank you for your concern, but I'll be more worried about you guys. I'll be home and safe long before you will. Carla shook her head and leaned toward the soldiers. You should make him stay. Reed shook his head. Sorry, we're not going to do that. He's free to make his own choices, good or bad. He turned to Kurt. If you find food, grab it. There's nothing left on the shelves now, and you may find you're trying to survive on whatever food you had left behind, if there's anything left of the food you had. There's no public transport, few working utilities, no police force, no nurses. He shook his head again. Sir, it's your decision. But if you'll allow me to offer one piece of advice, it'd be to stay away from people, living or dead. Got it, Kurt responded, a little too quickly. Megan looked shocked. No police force? That's great. I know how well we humans respond when law and order and the constraints of civilization are removed. So who's giving the orders? For now, the government is still functioning. Congress has gone underground, and the President and Vice President have been moved to separate and secret locations. Critical infrastructure is controlled under martial law and is still ongoing. We'll be fine as long as things don't stay bad for too much longer. Matt had to ask. And how much longer is too much longer? Reed seemed to think for a few moments. A month? Maybe less? Carla sat back. Better get us to Atlanta, then. The turnpike at Chattanooga looked like it had been barricaded, knocked down, set fire to, and then built back up several times. Metzger bumped up over the guttering to cross into a field, then slowed under some trees. The ASV braked and he turned. Close as I can get you, Mr. Douglas. Kurt grunted and started to rise heavily from his seat, the bag weighing him down. Matt grabbed his arm. Please, Kurt, one last time. I think you should stay with us, just for a few days. Kurt smiled and patted Matt's hand. You'll be fine. He looked at Reed. I'll take some of that magic potion now. Reed held out a bottle the size of a soda bottle with a milky liquid inside. Keep reapplying it every 24 hours, more if you're sweating. Kurt went to take it, but Reed hung on. There's enough for about four days. You'd better be locked indoors by then, sir. He released the bottle. Carla spoke, an anxious look on her face. He's right, Kurt. When you get home, seal yourself in and keep listening to the radio. She seemed to think for a few seconds. And don't go patting any stray dogs or cats. Everything, warm or cold-blooded, could be infested. Kurt looked at the small bottle in his hands, his face carrying a hint of doubt. He looked back at the sergeant. Seeing as I'll be the one on the outside, I'll need this more than you guys. I could do with a little more. Being on the outside is your choice, sir. There is no more. Reed's eyes never wavered. Kurt's expression hardened, and his hand dropped to his lap. 
For a split second, Matt thought the big man was contemplating asking again, this time with a gun in his hand. Reed's eyes narrowed slightly. He knew what Kurt was thinking. The hint of a confident smile touched his lips, and after a second, Reed gave an almost imperceptible shake of his head. Don't try it, the action said. The smile never left his lips. Mesker operated the side door, and it swung open. Sunlight streamed in, along with a gust of fresh air. Good luck, sir. Kurt saluted and stepped out. He turned and ducked down, looking back into the armored vehicle's red interior. I wish you all luck, and... Metzger closed the door. Chapter 22 Kurt jogged through the alleyways, staying low and trying to hold his breath. Rubbish was piled high, forming black plastic mountains and valleys on every sidewalk. Lumpy puddles of flesh, all different hues and sizes, dotted the streets. There was a small one with long hair piled on top, and the brightly colored clothing of a child. A larger one with new leather shoes and a wristwatch, and still another with a stained baseball cap. They were everywhere. No one came to clean up anymore, and the dying had simply stopped moving and allowed the bugs free reign. Other than the odd newspaper page blowing down the street or door swinging on a hinge somewhere, there was no sound. Still, Kurt had the feeling there were plenty of eyes watching him from behind darkened windows and pulled blinds. He had passed several barricades across streets and had no luck locating any off-road vehicles to jump gutters or cross fields. His feet hurt, but he was damned if he was going to rest just yet. He paused outside a bike store, considering for only a second. Inside, he pulled a new Bear Mountain bike from a rack and rode it out the door, swerving but gathering speed swiftly. He knew the area, but it seemed almost alien to him. He bumped over some debris, and his back was temporarily racked with pain from the massive weight he carried. It'd be worth it when he got it all home, he thought. He always remembered his father telling him that when people fail, currencies fail, and countries fail, they turn to gold as the basis for trade. He'd be ready. He stopped at the edge of the airport, sighting a row of small, single-prop Cessnas still tied down with their wheels chalked. At least a few of them would be partially gassed up. He only needed enough for an hour's flying time. He looked along the runway. Other than some debris, there were no go-home banners or any sign of a band of maniacs like the one they'd encountered at Tullahoma. He reached back to feel the gun at his waist. One thing was for sure. This time, he'd shoot first. He rode slowly between the outer buildings, then stepped off his bike and hid in the shadows watching for a good five minutes. There was nothing. The fence around the runways was down. Kurt checked his gun again and then sprinted for the nearest plane. Matt peered through the slotted, armored windows as the vehicle roared down the roads on the west side of Johns Mountain Reserve. They avoided the main highways, bouncing over dirt fields when the road was blocked. Once in a while, Matt noticed a dazed-looking person wandering the dead zones between houses or the stretches of forest. Some were still in clothes, others were stripped bare and running with blood. Some would wave and some would stand, staring at nothing, as though their soul had already left their body behind. Reed called out the names for each, as though they were on a bird-spotting field trip. Bloomers, skinners, comas, rabbits. It seemed the mite infestation affected people in different ways. For the most part, it caused the destruction of the dermal layer that had been inflicted upon Jorgensen. Then there were the bloomers, the living egg factories, their bodies covered in hundreds of thousands of budding sacs that would swell and then burst, infecting miles of countryside. The strange thing was, these poor creatures lived the longest, 
and until they actually ruptured, were the least infectious. It was as if the mites refused to let them die, preferring that they survived and continued to produce new generations of the parasite. Reed pointed again to a figure standing at a corner, and he had Metzger slow the vehicle. It was a man, his skin hanging like red gauze from his frame. He didn't turn to the vehicle and didn't move. He just stood there, mouth open and eyes vacant. Coma. He'll most likely stay there until he just falls to pieces. Reed motioned ahead and Metzger sped away. Most humane thing to do would be to put him out of his misery, he snorted softly. Not enough ammunition. That's horrible, Matt grimaced. That it is, sir. But I'll tell you what's more horrible. Seeing what happens when a pack of rabbits attack sad sacks like that. The rabbits stopped being human long ago. There's just a single base instinct left in them, to feed. They eat them? Matt rubbed his face, then regretted it. Ah, shit! The insecticide stung his eyes, which were already watering from the vapors inside the cabin. Reed continued to talk softly, describing more denizens of their new world. There were other types of infested, too. Some were using powerful medication to slow the spread of the mite. Usually they ended up brain-dead and stripped of their skin long before their bodies succumbed. But many managed to get organized, anger and resentment burning hotly through their veins. These were the militias, the mobs that saw the government as being responsible for their plight. These were the ones that Reed and Metzger feared the most. Matt squinted through the thick glass as they slowed at a road junction. There was a boarded-up building that could have been a store once. He saw a shape in the doorway. Matt frowned, trying to concentrate on the figure. He caught a glimpse of disheveled and stained clothing, and a head swathed in bandages, Egyptian mummy-like. He blinked, and they had passed it. He turned to the group in the back of the ASV, but no one was paying attention. Most looked lost in their own thoughts, or were dozing in the vehicle's chemical warmth. Carla leaned forward to read. How much farther? As the crow flies around eighty miles, but the way we're going, add another fifty to that. Sorry, best we can do. But it gives us a better chance to avoid built-up areas. Things are a little crazy in there right now, Reed said. Carla nodded. Do we have enough fuel? Reed nodded. Just. We've stripped out most of our heavy armaments and included an extra fuel tank. Our job is remote patrol rather than engagement, so we can usually get a couple of hundred extra out of her. We'll be rolling in on vapor, but that'll do. Silence fell again. They passed Rome, Cedartown, and Rockmart, traveling well south before swinging back toward Atlanta. Megan nudged Carla. I'm busting. Carla winced. I know how you feel. She leaned forward. Sergeant Reed, can you tell me if we'll be taking an, um, comfort stop soon? Reed looked back, frowning. He glanced down at a storage crate that held a large bottle. Carla followed his gaze and her face dropped. Not in a million years, buddy. Do you think you can hold on for another hour or two? No, Carla and Megan said in unison. Fresh air would be good. Matt squinted as he peered toward Reed. This insecticide is giving me a headache like I've been on a six-hour vodka binge. Reed looked at Metzger, who kept his eyes on the road. What do you think? Metzger shrugged. We just passed Powder Creek getting more built up the closer in we get, but still pretty empty out here. He looked at Reed and shrugged again. Reed nodded, then pointed to a stand of trees just off the road. Pull in under there, he turned. We'll take ten. Metzger bumped up into the field. Want me to get on the barbecue? Reed looked along the tree line for a moment. 
Nah, should be okay as long as we're quick. He raised his voice. And we will be quick, ladies and gentlemen. He turned to his driver. Be good for both of us to stretch our legs as well. Metzger pushed the ASV farther into the field, bumping across the uneven surface. The independent suspensions and portal-geared hubs lifted the tough machine a good 16 inches off the ground, clearing the largest holes and bits of debris. The vehicle growled to a halt under some trees, and Metzger let it idle for a few moments before switching it off. Both men sat staring out into the green edges of the field. The long afternoon shadows made the darkness under the low branches deep and secretive. I don't like it. Reed's eyes were narrowed. In and out and no sightseeing. He punched the release and the rear cabin doors wind open. A rush of fresh air flooded in and everyone tumbled out, the attraction of leaving the cramped space impossible to resist. Not far and not long, Reed called after them. Yope groaned as he straightened up, putting hands in the center of his back and stretching. I wonder where Kurt is now. Matt looked up into a sky darkening toward twilight. He'll be okay. He's trained to survive. I should have gone with him. Yope looked pained, and Matt patted his shoulder. Might have been a bad move. For now, it's safer for us to all stick together, and definitely with the soldiers, until we know exactly what we're dealing with. Yope nodded. I think so, too. Matt saw that Carla and Megan were headed toward the trees. He followed. In the warm evening climate, cicadas zummed from the trees and crickets sang in the grass. It took Matt a minute to work out what was missing. There were no birds. This time of year, swallows should be zooming past them, low to the ground, and other birds warbling from within the green branches. He inhaled deeply. Things were different now, the soldiers had said. Where do you think you're going? Megan turned and smiled. Just an escort. Matt squared his shoulders and grinned back. I don't think so. Megan waved him off. I do. Reed had his hands on his hips. He looked squarely at Matt, but his warning was for all of them. Go with them and keep a lookout. This is no time or place for shyness. Reed held out a squat handgun, but Matt shook his head. It's okay, we'll just be a few feet in. He turned to Megan and Carla. Won't we? Sure, Megan threw back over her shoulder as the women ducked behind a couple of large trees. Metzger had moved into the tree line a few dozen feet farther down and was urinating in a rapid stream against a trunk, reminding Matt that he needed to go as well. Hurry up, I'd like a turn this century, too. Pass me the roll of paper, will you? Megan laughed. Or am I supposed to do the shake? Go the shake. But just remember, no matter how much you shiver and dance, the last few drops end up in your pants. Matt smiled broadly at the trees. Carla popped her head around the tree. Nice one, Matt. He bowed. Benefits of a higher education, obviously. Carla stepped out, zipping up her pants, and much to Matt's relief, she was soon followed by Megan. Yope had disappeared a few trees farther up. Matt mock-saluted the women. Changing of the guard? Megan pointed to the largest tree. There's a good one. Need me to stand watch? Matt shook his head. Nope, I suffer from stage fright. Matt jogged into the tree line and looked back. Reed gave him a small wave, keeping a close eye on the spot where he and Yope had entered, and also on the thickets of trees to the north and south of them. Taking no chances, Matt thought. As he relieved himself, he saw that Carla had walked up close to the young soldier and was talking rapidly, while Reed nodded and folded his arms. Matt exhaled slowly at the satisfying release of pressure and looked up into the trees, noticing that the cicada's song had silenced. Bit early for bedtime, he thought. 
Matt, Megan called, softly but urgently. Huh? He zipped up and stepped out. The group was turned toward him, and he frowned at the scrutiny. As he took a few more steps, he saw that their focus was actually directed beside or behind him, toward the trees at his rear. He turned his head and froze, feeling a jolt all the way up his spine. Metzger was being held by the strangest individual he had ever seen. Raggedy, loose clothing, his head completely covered in red-soiled bandages. The creature could have been mistaken for a cheap extra in the next Egyptian mummy movie, but for the fact that where one hand held the collar of the young soldier, the other held the stubby black pipe of a shortened shotgun, jamming it into Metzger's neck. Matt eased backward. There was a crackling from the forest as more of the miserable creatures ambled out toward them. Keep coming, Professor Kearns, slowly. It was Reed, but Matt didn't need to be told. He'd keep backing all the way into the truck if he could. Megan grabbed him and pulled him close. He spoke out of the side of his mouth. Who the hell are those guys? Skinner Militia. They dosed themselves up with a cocktail of steroids, antibacterials, and anything else they can find. They managed to keep functioning, even bandaging their bodies to stop them falling apart. Reed lowered his hand toward his holster. We call them militias, but they're more like a cult or some sort of quasi-religious fundamentalists. They believe that the shedding of their skins is the Lord's punishment, the skin coming off a sign of evil being cast out. There's so many of them, Megan sounded nervous. Yep, and I'll give you one guess who they blame for their predicament. Great. Matt looked over his shoulder toward their vehicle. Running distance, he thought. Yope crowded in close. What do they want? Reed licked his lips. What do they want? They want everything. Our food, water, clothing, vehicle, and us. Back up, slowly. He started to move. Can we talk to them? Carla stood her ground. No, they'll burn us alive to save us from ourselves. Now back up toward the vehicle. Carla still didn't move, her face becoming furious. What about Corporal Metzger? We can't leave him. I won't. Can't do a thing with a handgun. They'll shoot us all down in a blink. Got to get to the flamethrower. That'll even things up a bit. Matt saw that the forest was bleeding disembodied spirits wrapped in filthy bandages. The one holding Metzger shook him and marched him forward, leaning in close and whispering something in the corporal's ear. Matt saw that his sidearm had been removed. The soldier's expression was blank, but there was the paleness of fear in his cheeks. He looked like a man who knew he was going to die. You folks stop there right now. Believe me, that devil's cannon is not going to be used this day. The voice that came from the bloody slit in the bandages was surprisingly strong and clear. There was intellect and education behind those wrappings. Keep going, Reed spoke softly. When I say run, you damned well run. Yope, the farthest out, started to creep backward a little faster. The bandaged leader moved the shotgun from Metzger's neck, bringing it around to rest on his shoulder and lining up Yope. He fired, the blast deafeningly loud. Metzger brought a hand up to his ear, gritting his teeth, his eardrum probably ruptured. Matt looked to Yope, but the scientist was gone. He'd been thrown ten feet farther back. The side of his head was missing just above his right eye. Jesus Christ! Matt felt the gorge rise in his throat. Turning back, he saw that the shotgun was now pointed at him. His stomach flipped, and he felt himself tingle all over, waiting for the next blast. Once again, the cultured voice rang out. I'm real sorry you made me do that. I don't want to hurt anyone else, so please stay where you are. Last time I ask, nicely. Matt could feel the eyes behind the slit move along each of their faces, weighing, analyzing, 
before stopping at Carla. You. I know you. Carla's eyes went wide. You are one of those responsible. You made this happen. You brought this to us. His voice rose, strong and sonorous. Brothers and sisters, I give you the corruptors, the CDC in all its oppressive and poisonous glory. Oh, God. Carla edged back. Do not move. Reed whispered the words, and Matt saw him exhale, his eyes glassy and his face racked with indecision. Metzger still had his hand up beside his head, blood leaking from his ear. His eyes focused on Reed. The two men stared at each other for several seconds, both becoming calm as an unspoken communication passed between them. Reed spoke, the words barely audible. Get ready. Faster than the bandaged man holding him could react, Metzger slammed his hand down onto the shotgun barrel, gripping it, and whipping his other elbow back hard. Run! They all turned and sprinted. Even Carla only hesitated for a split second before dashing toward the armored vehicle. At the door, Matt glanced back, allowing Megan and Carla to leap in. Metzger was shuddering. His grip was still on the barrel of the gun, but the bandaged attacker had his hand on the hilt of a huge hunting knife buried deep into the soldier's gut. He jerked it upward, slicing deeper into the corporal's belly, and brought his face close to Metzger's, speaking to him, perhaps praying for him. Matt had seen enough. He grabbed the doorframe just as a shotgun blast roared from behind them. Reed was in. He yelled over his shoulder, Door closing now! More shotgun blasts, along with other caliber rounds, whacked and pinged off the toughened exterior of the ASV. Matt leaned forward. Are you going to use the flamethrower? The vehicle roared to life, Reed's face a mask of furious determination. They killed them. They just killed them. Carla shook her head in disbelief. Her voice began to rise. Why would they do that? Matt raised his voice over Carla's. Reed, are you going to use the flamethrower? Carla shook her head. But he knew me. Who are they? She looked hard at Reed, searching for answers. Quiet down. Right now I'm just going to get the fuck out of here. The ASV started to spin, grass divots flying out from behind it. Reed turned the wheel hard, sending the vehicle into an arc that brought them close to the mob of bandaged horrors. Now that they were out from under the trees, Matt could see what a putrid group of creatures they were. Most wore bandages on their head and hands, but some were fully wrapped in strips of cloth sodden with fluids that had exuded from their miserable bodies. Some of the creatures weren't completely covered, and between the wrappings he could see the muscles and tendons of exposed flesh where the dermal layer had been sloughed off. He felt ill. If it wasn't for Yope and Metzger being so readily dispatched, he might have actually felt sorry for them. Shots peppered the vehicle, drum beating against the panels and scarring the windows. Reed spoke without turning. Don't worry, this baby can take just about anything these fucking freaks can throw at it. Matt could see the leader directing his ragged troops, pointing to the wheels. Dozens of weapons fired at the thick rubber tires. What about the tires? They're run flats. They can withstand a lot of punishment, as long as... He trailed off, appearing to concentrate on his driving. Matt looked out again and saw that the mob was keeping pace with the bumping vehicle. Several of them had shotguns, which they pumped and blasted, pumped and blasted, over and over into the tires. Others had handguns or rifles, which they used to do the same. The vehicle started to lean toward one side. Don't sweat it. We can run on four flats if we have to. This time he finished his thought. Just not very far. The ASV now had its armored rear facing the Skinners. Before the gears could really bite, another of the back tires exploded. Even without his hands on the wheel, Matt could feel the vehicle's performance becoming sluggish. 
Let's go, let's go, let's go, Reed was chanting to himself, his hands white-knuckled tight on the large wheel as he powered toward the road. Matt turned back to the front windscreen, urging the vehicle on as they approached the end of the grassed area. A line of skinners ran ahead of them and appeared to pull on some ropes. Like something medieval, sharpened logs rose from the ground, six feet long, pointed ends aimed towards the careening machine. More men arrived, carrying long wooden braces to hold the pikes in place. Reed's teeth were bared, and Matt could have sworn he heard the man growl. The hell you do, he swiveled in his seat. Get up here now and get on the flamethrower. Matt felt himself go numb. Huh? Reed struggled with the wheel and yelled over his shoulder. If they stop us, we're all dead. I need you to burn me a path. Matt started to climb into the front, but Megan hauled him back. You have the worst aim of anyone I know. She shoved him aside and climbed in beside the soldier. She copied what she had seen him do before, flipping out the small panel with the control board and miniature screen, then placed a hand on the joystick. What do I do now? Toggle the bomb sight over what you want to hit, and then press the button down hard and keep it down. Now! Megan moved the red circle toward a cluster of bandaged bodies. Small arms fire whacked into the windscreen as she punched down hard on the red button. There was a whoosh, and a jet of jellied fuel shot forty feet toward one of the clustered groups. It coated them, their bodies exploding into greasy flames. Inside the cabin they couldn't hear the screams. Megan shot another jet, and this time the Skinners dropped their wooden braces and scattered, just a few remaining to dance madly, their clothing ablaze from the superheated jellied fuel. Reed accelerated, and without the braces holding them in place, the logs exploded out of the way. Yeah, fuck you two. Reed accelerated, and Matt and Carla crowded to the rear window, watching the band of bandaged men and women recede. We're safe, for now. Reed used a sleeve to wipe his brow. Matt leaned forward and placed his hand on Megan's shoulder. Are you okay? She shook her head, putting her hands over her face and grinding the heels of her palms into her eyes. Who the hell was that guy? The big one in charge. He was no lunatic, Matt asked, rubbing Megan's back between her shoulder blades. Reed wiped his face again. I think the big guy was Dylan, their leader. We couldn't have picked a worse place to stop for a piss. Maybe it was just shit luck, but I doubt it. More like they're tracking us somehow. They even managed to set that ambush. Or maybe they've got ambushes everywhere, and they just needed to get to it while we were there. Megan sat back, her eyes still closed. They have a leader? Reed shrugged. More like their local messiah. He hangs around the Atlanta outskirts picking off our patrols. We think he knows there's plenty of activity going on inside the CDC, so he continually watches and monitors it. How does he know? Carla had been listening. Reed's face darkened. We've found some of our people. They'd been tortured. He wants information about us. He knew me. He blamed the CDC, blamed me. His voice, I know it from somewhere. Carla frowned. Reed turned back to the road. He blames us all for everything. You know the type, it was all a government conspiracy. We released it into the poor neighborhoods on purpose. We have a cure but aren't releasing it, etc., etc. He tilted his head. But Dylan is different. He's smart and seems to know what we're doing and when. Gotta be tapped in somehow. Do you know who he is? Carla asked. Reed shrugged. Just rumors. Chief suspect is Brock Dillenbeck. He was an evangelist who became a holy roller senator. Got caught with a hooker and his fly open. He disappeared, but the infestation became a bigger issue than a shamed politician gone missing. Dillenbeck. Senator Brock Dillenbeck. He toured the CDC a year ago. He wanted to cut back our funding, and I was one of the specialists tasked with pushing back. 
Carla seemed to search her memory, trying to make a match with the voice she'd just heard. I... I just don't know. Reed grunted. Might be him, but we can't ever see him clearly, and the bandages also make a voice match difficult. It's certainly his style of sermonizing, though. Nothing like the end of the world to give you a pulpit and an audience, Matt sighed. So how far can we travel? We took some serious dents, but we're okay. This is an M-1117 Guardian, a highly mobile and lethal armored security vehicle, with armor designed to deal with small arms fire, mines, IEDs. It can even take an RPG hit. All running on four oversized, high-density, run-flat tires. We can keep going, but it'll be at a reduced speed. He shrugged. Lucky it was me that picked you up in this tin can, or you'd be... Lucky? Megan bristled. Yeah, lucky Yope and lucky Metzger. Just how lucky... Reed swung toward her. He was my cousin. He turned back, his jaws working beneath his cheeks, as though chewing on something tough and unpalatable. The words came through gritted teeth. So yeah, just be thankful it was him and me that picked you up. If we'd been in an open top, we'd all be dead, or worse. There's talk of cannibalism amongst the militias these days. Matt saw there were tears on Megan's face. He grasped her shoulder. Come here, Megs. She nodded and climbed out of the seat, then sat down next to him. Carla came and sat on the other side of her. Sorry. Her voice was so small, Matt thought he might have imagined the spoken word. Reed heard it and shook his head. No, I'm sorry. He turned briefly. You saved us back there. Thank you. She put her head in her hands, all the bravado of a few minutes ago fleeing her body. I've never killed anyone before. Matt bet that not many people had ever killed someone like that. Flamethrowers had been dropped from the U.S. military arsenal after the Korean War. Way too brutal a way to die and the effects on the surviving victims were even worse. You saved our lives, that's all you need to remember. Matt hugged her. She snorted wetly, looking up into his face. For what? The world has gone to shit. Carla rubbed Megan's neck. Come on, that's why we're here, remember? To put it all back together. Megan nodded, but put her face back in her hands. They roared on, no thought of stopping again. This time the ride wasn't as smooth. Matt noticed Sergeant Reed checking the gas gauge often and guessed that the shredded tires meant the going was rougher and therefore fuel consumption had gone up. At least, he thought grimly, with Yope and Metzger gone, they now carried less weight. Sorry, folks, we need to conserve fuel. I'm only going to turn the air con on for short bursts now. With that, the background whine disappeared. The vehicle started to heat up immediately. After just twenty minutes, Matt wiped his brow. Perspiration ran down his face and made his clothing stick to his chest and back. Carla and Megan were saturated and looked just as uncomfortable. He blinked the sting from his eyes as the repellent washed down from his forehead. He leaned forward. This stuff stings like fire. Reed spoke without turning. Pretty heavy-duty stuff. He turned to look at them. We're going to need to reapply soon. It's probably all washed off by now. Matt tapped the tank. There was only an inch or so left in the bottom. Looks like there's enough left for one more washdown, but maybe not for all of us. Then get in the suits. We're nearly home. Reed turned and grinned. Gonna be damned hot, but better than ending up a Skinner or Bloomer, right? Dylan dragged Metzger's body to the center of the clearing, ignoring the burning men and women who had been in the flamethrower's path. He dropped Metzger and placed one large foot on his back. Dylan exhaled slowly through his nose, 
brown fluid leaking down over the bandages covering his lips and chin. He motioned to the still burning corpses. Oh, brothers and sisters, how they treat us. He looked down and shook his head. Their friend is dead, and they leave him behind like trash. He is dead because they care about nothing but themselves, and yet they turn the flames of hell upon us for simply asking them to join us, asking them to re-examine their own souls. Slowly his large bandaged head came up, his voice growing stronger. Dylan looked around. The field was now filled with bandaged figures, some limping, some bent over or dropping fluid and patches of skin, like fleshy leaves from autumn trees. They looked like the damned souls of hell, and he loved them all. He smiled and raised an arm, pointing to one and then another. Some whooped with delight, others fell to their knees as his gaze fell upon them. While he watched, a heavily bandaged figure pushed to the front and offered him a military multi-band walkie-talkie. Dylan lifted it slowly to his ear. Speak. He listened for several seconds, letting his gaze run across his flock. Behind the bandages, his lips slowly began to curl into a smile. No, don't touch anything. Bring it to Atlanta. I have an immediate use for it. Dylan tossed the radio device back and nodded to the masses before him. Soon, brothers and sisters, soon they will beg to join us, he pointed after the truck, and we will find them. We know where they are going, we know where they hide, brewing up more monstrosities to unleash upon us, he opened his arms wide. We who are indeed free from pain know nirvana. But they do not. They are still chained by their fear and their pathetic skins. Dylan closed his eyes and lifted his head, his voice now a stentorian roar. Without pain there would be no suffering. Without suffering we would never learn from our mistakes. To make it right... Pain and suffering is the key to all windows. Without it, there is no way of life. So saith the great goddess Angelina Jolie. May her name be forever blessed. His head dropped again, and his eyes slowly opened. And we can show them suffering like they have never known. Matt stood and pulled suits from the rack, then handed one to Megan and another to Carla. Ladies' fitting room to the rear. He dropped his suit onto the seat, then unzipped the front of the heavy PVC mesh all-in-one suit and studied the instructions plastered on the inside. Carla had her legs in the bright orange outfit already, her experience showing. Air tanks? Reed shook his head. Nope, but it has microfilters fine enough to keep a good-sized bacterium out, so it'll work on the bugs and their eggs. Carla grunted her acknowledgement and sat back down with the hood and Perspex faceplate hanging down her back. She turned to see if she could assist Megan while Matt struggled into his own suit. She looked past Matt to read. Want me to take over while you get into yours? No thanks, I need the extra vision and mobility for driving as we pass into the city proper. I can use some of the spray. Reed continued to drive without turning. Matt suddenly felt very constricted within the large and bulky suit. In another thirty minutes they passed through Mableton and entered the outskirts of western Atlanta. The streets were still eerily quiet with mountains of rubbish, and a few open car doors. A miserable-looking German shepherd with sagging, bloody fur raked around in an open trash bag. Reed slowed to look hard at it. Don't burn it, Megan said sharply. Matt wondered why she was so suddenly protective of the animal. Its days were over anyway. Perhaps she had no stomach for seeing the flamethrower in action again. 
Better for it and us if it was dead. Reed watched it a few seconds longer, then pulled away. Okay, this is where it gets tricky. I'm going to break radio silence and try and raise HQ again now that we're close. Reed pushed a pellet into his ear that looped behind it to hold it in place. He paused, then removed the device and flicked the switch to cabin receive. Might as well all listen, this concerns us all. He turned a dial on the dashboard and spoke in a methodical, clipped manner. This is Sergeant Reed in Unit 109er coming in with special guests. Over. Matt, Carla, and Megan were transfixed, listening intently. The clear line suddenly began to hiss and crackle, as if it had somehow been altered to a different frequency. A familiar voice floated into the cabin, but not the one they had expected to hear. You're not home yet, Sergeant. I'd just like to say that I'm sorry about your friends. It's terrible losing people, isn't it? I've lost hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands. And you know who did this to us, don't you? There was more hiss and crackle. Dylan. Reed spat the name. The crackle cleared momentarily. Sergeant, if you bring your special guests to me, I can promise you no harm will come to them. In fact, I can also promise you wealth, power, and a cure. Together we can bring the strongholds down, but first they need to shed their corrupt layers and see the beauty of the skinless fuck-off. Reed fiddled with the frequency. This is Bennings. Come back, 109-er. This is Reed. Good to hear you, sir. Where'd you go, Sergeant? You dropped out. Unwelcome hijack by you-know-who, sir. We're coming in now. Good to hear. We've got a chopper up. That'll keep you under surveillance. You can come in via Houston Mill Road. Do not stop. Do not get out. This is heavy Skinner and Bloomer territory. And be careful. Our hijacker has a lot of friends on the perimeter. Copy that. See you all within the hour, God willing. Reed flicked the switch up, then turned and grinned. Nearly home, folks. He turned back to the windscreen, and the now lumbering vehicle lurched forward, the tires low and squashy on the debris-covered road. Matt turned to Megan and shrugged. Home? I can't even remember what it looks like anymore. She leaned her head on his shoulder. Beats a jungle, I guess. Carla was leaning back against the wall of the cabin, her face turned to the window so she could watch the passing streetscape. Suddenly she jumped forward, startling Matt, and pressed her nose to the armored glass. Stop! Jesus! What? No way, lady! Reed hunched his shoulders and continued driving, I said stop the truck now! Carla was yelling, her voice near ear-splitting as she punched out every word. There's a little kid out there! Megan and Matt looked but saw nothing. Carla, are you sure? Her voice didn't lower a single decibel. I said stop this fucking truck or so help me I'll... Reed jammed on the brakes and swung in his seat. What part of don't stop did you not understand? Look, you cannot help these people, Dr. Nero, but you can do a hell of a lot more good by being at the... Carla hit the door button and flipped her hood up, sealing it, as the door lifted. She was out before Sergeant Reed could react. Wait, Carla, wait! Matt pulled on his hood and leapt after her, with Megan hot on his heels. Now free of the vehicle's cabin, they could hear the wails of a little girl drifting from around the corner. Carla was already running. Matt and Megan did the same, trying not to let her get too far ahead of them. Matt had to hold down the front of his suit to keep the Perspex faceplate centered over his eyes. The hood tended to slip back, obscuring his vision. He breathed in damp air. Even though the microfilters allowed a good flow of air, the transfer was slow, and the heat and humidity of respiration built up in the suits almost immediately. 
These things weren't built for running in. Rounding the corner, they saw that Carla had stopped about ten feet from a tiny figure. The little girl was holding something that had probably once been white, a rabbit or an old teddy bear. She was dressed in nothing more than a bedraggled nightdress, her stick-like arms and legs covered in bruises. She had her hands up over her face as she sobbed. Matt and Megan pulled up behind Carla. The girl was sandwiched between them and a mob of about a dozen people, many holding stones, broomsticks, and in one man's hand, a long shovel. Around the girl's feet, broken debris attested to the mob's actions. Carla advanced, pointing to the group of people. Stay where you are! Stay back from her, you— The people stared wide-eyed at the bright orange suit gesturing wildly at them. Matt picked up a broken broomstick and brandished it. A few of the people wandered away, losing interest. Several stayed, their faces creased in anger. They pointed at the small girl and said something, but their words were muffled by the masks tied over their chins. Piss off! Matt threw his stick with surprisingly good aim, striking one of the men in the chest. The man swore and reached around behind him. When his hand reappeared, it held a hunting knife as long as his arm. Oh, shit, Matt whispered. The little girl pulled her hands away from her face. As soon as she saw Carla, she screamed, the bulky suit too much for her already strained nerves. Carla held up her hands and kneeled, keeping her movements slow and calm. She carefully reached up and unzipped her suit, pushing back the hood and exposing her sweat-streaked face. She smiled at the little girl, who stopped crying. Carla, that's not a good idea. Matt looked for another weapon. Megan appeared beside him with a trash can lid. The man with the knife screamed, his voice still muffled through his mask, but the volume giving his words form. Are you fucking crazy? You want to die? She's about to pop, man! He pointed his blade at the girl and took a step toward her, just as Reed backed the ASV into the street. The electronic whine coming from the roof-mounted cannon as it swung toward him spoke louder than words. The knife man shook his head. Your funeral, bitch! He motioned to his companions and slowly backed up the deserted street. Carla let fly with a bottle for good measure. The ASV's door opened and Reed motioned with his thumb. Carla ignored him and turned back to the girl, holding out her hand. The girl did the same, their fingers touching. Reed banged on the window with his fist. Matt watched as he shouted to her from behind the armored glass, his motions becoming more determined. He was the only one without a suit, so he was loath to leave the sterilized cabin. By now, Carla had the little girl by the shoulders and was kneeling directly in front of her. Matt and Megan approached and saw that what they had thought was a teddy bear was in fact a dead cat, or rather just the remains of its fur, stiffened at one end with something rust-colored. Oh, God. Megan put her hand to where her mouth would be behind the faceplate. Carla smiled and brushed hair from the girl's face. What's your name, sweetheart? She gently wiped at the girl's grimy brow with her thumb. As the oily dirt came away, they could see the lumps, flesh-colored and the size of peas under her skin. Dr. Nero, please put your suit back on and get away from her. It was too much for Sergeant Reed, who had got out of the vehicle. His sidearm was in his hand, and he kept glancing from Carla to the buildings on either side of the road. He talked through gritted teeth, perhaps hoping the dental barrier would somehow keep anything nasty from entering his mouth. I can't be out here. Please, you must get away from her. She's a bloomer, or soon will be. You can't help her. What? Carla's face screwed up into a mix of disbelief and fury. Well, we're going to goddamn try. No, 
we are not. Come on, people, this is exactly what we were told not to do. Reed spoke while watching the street. Carla turned back to the girl, ignoring him. What's your name, sweetie? Maddie. Everyone calls me Maddie, she sniffed. Carla looked like she had received an electric jolt. Maddie? Madeline? She blinked a few times, then pushed the hair back off Maddie's lumpy face. My name is Carla. Now, do you remember where your mommy and daddy are? Maddie sniffed some more. Her mouth turned down. Mommy's skin all fell off, and Daddy went out to get some food and didn't come back. All I've got left is Baloo. She held up the bedraggled piece of skin and fur. Carla recoiled slightly. Matt assumed the smell of the dead animal must have been revolting. Reed edged closer, walking sideways. Please! Please get back from her. She's highly contagious. Those bumps, they're full of the mite eggs. Megan grimaced behind the screen of her faceplate. We've still got enough bug spray on to give an elephant asthma, and we're in suits. We'll be safe. No, we won't. We're not safe here, and we're not safe from her. Reed angled himself so he could watch the houses and darker areas of the street. You know that Dylan has his followers watching for us by now. He glanced at Carla. And she can't come with us. Sorry. Reed took a step back toward the ASV, but Carla shook her head. We can't. We won't just leave her. Carla stood, gripping the girl's forearm. Maddie winced from the gentle pressure. Skin sensitive to the touch, Matt noted. Reed paused, his face imploring. I'll explain when we're back in the truck. Look, I'll send someone for her, I promise, okay? No deal. She comes or I stay. Carla stood firm. There must be other options, Sergeant. Megan went and stood with Carla. Matt motioned to Reed. Just give us a minute here. He knelt beside the tiny girl and smiled, hoping she could see his face behind the steamed-up faceplate. Hi, I'm Matt. How do you feel, Angel? Do you hurt, or are you itchy anywhere? She wiped her nose. Those men threw rocks at me, but only hit me a few times. They were bad shots. Matt smiled. Lucky for you. Um, and those lumps on you... When did they come up? She looked up and tilted her head, thinking hard for a few seconds. They started on... Her lips moved and she seemed to be counting to herself. I think it was yesterday or the day before. Or the day before that. But they were small then. They don't hurt. She shook her head. Matt nodded. That's good. Are you thirsty? She nodded vigorously. Yes, and hungry. Have you got any cookies? The ones with pink icing on them? They're called pinkies. My mommy always gets them on Saturdays from... Her face went blank as memories came flooding back. It's okay, darling. Carla hushed her and started to lead her back to the vehicle. Reed stepped in front of her, his hand up. No, Dr. Nero, she cannot enter the vehicle. That is an order. His face was deadly serious. Out of our way. You can't order us. We're civilians, remember? Besides, we can dose her in what's left of the repellent. That will cleanse her temporarily. Reed shook his head violently. There was panic in his eyes now. No, she's a bloomer. When those blisters pop, she'll cover several square miles in micro larvae. Within an enclosed space, we'll be overwhelmed. His eyes were wide. It's not just skin contact that can be a problem. You haven't seen what a lungful of those parasites will do. They'll eat you from the inside out. He shook his head, frustration creasing his features. What's the matter with you? You know this better than anyone. 
Carla took a step closer to the vehicle's open door. She held up one hand. Take it easy, Sergeant. Reed shook his head. Please. For the first time, Reed's gun hand came into view. The gun not up, but now in sight. Matt felt torn. He wanted to see the little girl safe, but also knew the danger she posed. He could feel the waves of anguish coming off the soldier. Carlo was putting him in an untenable position. Matt eased a little closer, trying to get in front of Carla. Uh, maybe we can put her in one of the spare suits, and then get her straight into quarantine once we're back at the CDC. Matty had moved behind Carla's leg, and Carla's face was taking on a fierce, protective look. This was not just about saving the infested girl. Matt recognized the name. It was about the daughter she couldn't save twenty years ago. Matt couldn't believe Reed would shoot Carla, but the soldier's eyes kept darting down to the child. Matt didn't like the thought that jumped into his head. He wouldn't. Reed straightened, his face blank. I'm sorry. The gunshot was loud in the near silent street, and Reed was punched backward a good six feet. He lay still. Matt grabbed Megan and pulled her down. He looked back toward where he thought the shot had come from, but all he could see was the inside of his hood. He suddenly remembered. Turning his head didn't turn the faceplate. The only window he had on the outside world, and it only offered 180 degrees of vision. Maddie started to cry again, and Carla hugged her to her breast. More shots rang out, and chips from the pavement sprayed both of them. Carla turned her face away, offering herself as the only protection. Matt yelled to Carla, Okay, we've got no choice now. Back to the truck. Megan and Matt sprinted to the fallen soldier. Reed was still motionless on the road, his entire torso blood red. The soldier's gun was beside his hand. Matt grabbed it and spun, holding the faceplate in front of his eyes. The street was deserted. Great, a sniper, Matt thought. Fuck you, Dylan. Give me a hand here. He grabbed one of Reed's hands and Megan took hold of the other one. Together they started to drag him toward the armored vehicle, leaving a long streak of red on the road, like a garish snail trail of human life. More shots came, but it was obvious they weren't targeting Megan or Matt, or even Reed now that he was out of action. The firing concentrated on Carla and Maddie. Carla picked the small girl up, her face pinched as if squinting would offer protection against the flying lead projectiles. She kept the small girl's face pressed into her neck. A flaming bottle of petrol exploded a few feet from them, a pool of orange flame splashing at Carla and Maddie. Matt saw the crowd coming back down the street. Some had revolvers, some rifles, and some had bottles with rags already alight, ready to throw. The guy with the knife was at the front. Here comes payback, Matt thought. Most of the men and women had masks over their faces, at least they're not Skinners, Matt thought crazily, as if the death the non-Skinners were about to rain down on them would make them any less dead. Matt let go of Reed's arm, his body still dozens of feet from the truck. He looked at Carla struggling with the girl and turned to Megan. Can you manage? She nodded behind her faceplate and started to tug hard on the injured man, his arm would be near wrenched from its socket, but it was life or death now. Matt zigzagged toward Carla, dragging in deep breaths through the microfilter and spitting perspiration that ran down into his mouth. He found it hard to see clearly. The steam on the inside of his faceplate made everything swim greasily. He reached out to Carla and Maddie just as a loud crack sounded from close by, and Carla disappeared from his view like magic. She scrambled back up, but blood streaked the front of her suit. Carla looked down, bewildered, wiping both hands through the red wetness and lifting them to her face. 
For a second or two, she was confused. Then she looked down and wailed. Maddie lay small and crumpled at her feet, like a large broken doll. Baloo, or what was left of him, was lying beside her. Carla sank to her knees. The shooting had stopped, the rabble's bloodthirsty anger perhaps blunted by the death, and satisfied its objective had been achieved. Matt knelt beside Carla as she rocked back and forth. Even in the heat the woman shivered, all the death and misfortune seeming to well up from deep in her soul. She threw her head back, screaming to the sky. She'd lost another Maddie, Matt thought, trying to pull her toward the armored vehicle. Carla shook him off and lifted the tiny body, squeezing it hard to her breast. As Matt watched, some of the small bubbles on Maddie's face and neck seemed to swell and then burst. Matt recoiled, remembering what Reed said about the mites devouring you from the inside out. Carla, inches from the tiny face, coughed and gagged, and Matt grabbed her, roughly pulling her back from the lifeless body. Let's go, we can't do anything else for her. Carla screamed, but let herself be pulled back, the small body sliding to the ground like a tiny bundle of rags. The mob came slowly now, keeping their distance, treating them like dangerous creatures to be shooed away or killed from a distance. Matt saw that one of them had a jerry can in his hand. God damn, she's bloomed! There was a roar of disgust from the group. Another flaming bottle exploded nearby. Move it! He dragged Carla toward Megan, who was still struggling with Reed. Grab that arm! He let go of Carla, and almost trance-like, she took hold of the arm that Megan tugged on. Matt grabbed the other. There was the crash of breaking glass, a thump of ignition, and then a wave of heat erupted from within the open door of the ASV. A dumbass luck direct hit. Oh, no, no, no! Matt dropped Reed's arm and sprinted at the flaming vehicle, jumping inside, the heavy suit giving him temporary protection from the flames. He looked around madly, snatching a medical kit, some water, the sample vials, and the last dregs of the insecticide. Fuck! The suit started to melt and stick to his skin. The pain was phenomenal, and he gritted his teeth. He still had Reed's gun stuck into the suit's belt at his waist, pointed down at his groin. The bullets had to be getting hot. They'd spontaneously fire soon. That made up his mind. He dove and rolled free. Matt got to his feet, running as fast as the bulky suit would allow. Megan had taken several paces toward him, leaving the sprawled soldier behind. Matt waved her back as he raced over. Carla looked up as he arrived, and he jammed the meager supplies he had retrieved into her arms. Megan grabbed his arm, trying to see the burn on his suit, but he pulled away. We've got to get to cover, now! He pointed with his chin. Those buildings, quick, let's get out of sight! He and Megan each grabbed one of Reed's arms and started to drag him. They picked up speed, the soldier's boots bouncing along the ground. He groaned. A good sign, Matt thought. Hoped. The mob ran hard, converging not on Matt and the others, but on the burning ASV. Salvage was obviously on their minds, too. Matt and Megan slowed with the strain of pulling the large man. Megan lifted her head. Keep up, Carla. Matt saw that the scientist was slowing. The supplies clutched to her chest. He looked over his shoulder. Down here. The street was one of few not boiling with running figures. He turned back to the burning armored vehicle. Dozens were swarmed around it when the explosion came. The flamethrower tanks burst in a gigantic bowl of superheated jellied fuel, causing a pressure wave that blew Matt, Megan, and Carla off their feet, even though they had managed to get a few hundred feet away. Matt sat up and looked back. The mob that had been all over the flaming machine was decimated. Bodies and bits of flaming bodies, 
were scattered over the road. Few were moving. It was the break they had needed. They got to their feet, grabbed Reed, and scurried around the corner. Stop, stop! Megan let go of Reed's arm, dragging in heavy breaths. Her face behind the faceplate was pale. We need to find shelter and then work out how to get back to home base. Matt put his hand on her back and rubbed. You okay? She nodded. He looked at Carla, who had her head down, her hood still hanging limply on her shoulders. Carla, all right? Her head bobbed, but she didn't look at him. Yeah, shelter. I'm hoping the last traces of the repellent will give Carla and Reed a bit of protection. But we've got to get out of the open spaces. There's too much chance of being infested. Megan sucked in another deep breath, gathering her strength. Let's go. They dragged Reed around the corner, now having to rest every few dozen feet. Matt couldn't believe just how heavy a full-grown man could be. They paused at a plumbing supply store, and without a second thought, Matt kicked in the door. He hoped that the owner wasn't home. It seemed that kill or be killed was the standard course of action now. Hello? They waited just inside. Hello? Matt tilted his head and listened. After a full minute of silence, Carla gently shut the door behind them. They slumped to the floor. Carla leaned against the wall, her eyes shut tight, a look of distress on her face. Reed groaned again, and Matt crawled across to him and pulled open his shirt, exposing the ugly wound in his upper chest. Carla, I need your help. Megan knelt beside him, dragging the first aid kit with her, along with a wad of paper towels she had found. The wound still pumped scarlet blood, but it bubbled and popped with escaping gas. Punctured lung? Megan asked, as she wiped the blood from around the wound. Looks like it. Matt turned. Carla! He snapped his fingers to get her attention. It's all gone bad. Carla spoke to her hands folded in her lap. No, not all of it, and not yet. Come on, Carla, we need your help here. Matt yelled the words, and her head came up slowly, her eyes finally focusing on him. He's dying! Help us! After a moment, she nodded and wiped her nose on the thick plastic sleeve of her suit. She went to pull the hood and faceplate back up, and then stopped, snorting softly. What's the point now? She let the hood hang and came over to Matt and Megan. Reed coughed and blood lifted from his lips. Carla felt around the wound. Broken ribs, lung punctured and deflated. Might even be bullet fragments in there. We can't fix it here, but we need to keep it clean and drained. She got to her feet quickly. Matt felt relieved. Her businesslike professionalism had returned in an instant. Carla busied herself quickly searching lockers, drawers, and shelves, and came back with some tubing, scissors, and bleach. She reached into the first aid kit and grabbed some tape and a small bottle of alcohol, which she opened and splashed onto the wound. Megan, wipe that down. Next, she bathed the tubing and scissors with bleach. Cut me half a dozen six-inch strips of the tape. Matt and Megan worked quickly. Carla then cut about two inches of the tubing and carefully inserted it into the bullet wound. She took the tape strips and placed them around the outside, holding the tube in place, then pressed them down, sealing the wound edges at the skin level. Next, she bandaged him and created a sling to immobilize his arm and shoulder. Help me lift him. They raised Reed into a sitting position. Once seated, he groaned again. Reddish fluid dripped from the tiny tube. Matt grunted. Good job. Will that reinflate his lung? Carla wiped her hands. Nope, but it'll give him a fighting chance until we can get him to the medics at the CDC. That's just going to drain him. Otherwise, he could end up with a pneumothorax. His lung fills with fluid, 
and unescaped gases. He'd be dead in an hour. She stabbed his leg with a needle from the kit. Antibiotics and painkillers. He's going to have to be kept upright so he doesn't drown in his own blood. He'll be in a lot of pain, but the sedation will either keep him unconscious or spaced out for another few hours. Megan tossed damp bandages into the corner. A lot of blood, not to mention how much he left on the street. Will he... Carlin nodded. He'll need a transfusion, and quickly. She looked over the unconscious man's upper body. She smiled weakly. Let's take five and then see if the phones are working, or if we can find a radio or something we can use to contact the CDC. Roger that. Megan slumped, and Matt picked up the bottle of repellent, a few ounces left sloshing around in the bottom. He swallowed, nervous about bringing up the girl again. Carla, that poor little thing, Maddie, she was infectious, and you got a blast from the cloud. I saw it. He held the bottle out. There's enough left in here to dose your head and neck. Carla stared at the bottle in his hands. Her eyes didn't seem to focus as she spoke. Bloomers. It's an appropriate name. Like a flower opening, a viral bloom expands outward via explosive dispersion. She smiled sadly. This little monster is clever. It knows how to survive and spread. It's managed to exist for hundreds of millions of years. Matt poured the remaining acrid-smelling fluid onto a wad of bandages, soaking them through. He handed them to Carla, who rubbed the repellent over her face and neck, and then through her hair. She dropped the bandages and sat back, breathing hard, as if finishing a long run up a steep hill. She looked up at the ceiling. I need a holiday. She smiled dreamily, fatigued to the point of collapse. Megan sat close to her. Got anywhere in mind? A tropical paradise, perhaps? Carla shook her head and rubbed her face hard. No, had enough of those. Just somewhere with clean sheets and hot water. Now that would be luxury. I hear that. Matt poked around the small office, locating a phone on the wall. He lifted it and listened for a few seconds. There was an emergency broadcast of a recorded message, telling people to stay indoors. It went on to tell citizens to record any crimes they witnessed, but not to get involved, explaining that law enforcement was stretched and may not be able to attend quickly. Or at all, Matt thought grimly. He clicked the receiver and listened again. There was a dial tone. Got a tone. Carla, over here. Carla stood and walked slowly toward him. He barely recognized the frail and tired-looking person as the same strong, smart woman who had interviewed him not too long ago. She looked about as bad as he felt. Carla took the phone, listened, and then dialed. She waited, and when she spoke, there was relief on her face. She turned on the speakerphone so they could all hear. Go ahead, Hugh. Carla, what happened? You disappeared. She sighed. Long story. Bottom line is, Reed's hurt, badly. He's been shot. But we're okay. There was a girl, a bloomer. The truck is gone. We need help. Matt could hear Hughes groan over the speaker. The bloomers are our biggest problem. Walking time bombs. Another little gift from these arthropod monsters. If primarily pregnant females infest you, you don't shed skin. Instead, they keep you on your feet so you can bloom. We didn't find out until later. Microdispersal. It's how they went airborne and managed to infect everyone and everything so quickly. Yeah, we know that, now. But thanks for the heads up. Sorry, probably doesn't make a difference now. Just give them a wide berth. The bloomers are bad news. Carla snorted. The bloomers are bad news, the skinners are bad news, the gangs of vigilantes and the militias are bad news. 
The thin veneer of civilization is getting thinner all the time. She sighed. We need to get home, Hugh. We're tired. There was a pause, and then Dr. Francis Hewson spoke again, his voice sounding almost as drained as Carla's. Yes, yes, that is critical. It's getting dark, and we can't land. There are too many mobs in the vicinity now. Are you somewhere safe? Carla looked around. I have no idea. If you mean are we off the street, the answer is yes. Good. I suggest you hole up for the night and make a start first thing. You, as in us? Is that what you mean? I thought you would meet us. Carla frowned as she waited for a response. After a moment of silence, her head dropped. So we have to come to you now. There was the sound of a long exhalation over the line. They're closing in, Carla, ringing us. The militias are picking off our teams, kidnapping our people, and then returning them in states that are abhorrent. Just a week ago, we lost a full contingent of military technicians. It's too dangerous right now. We can guide you, but... Carla sniffed and nodded. Okay, Hugh. I'm sorry. It's the best we can do. Carla groaned, and Matt felt his shoulders slump. So close, he thought. Megan poured a few drops of alcohol into the repellent bottle, shook it, and then upended the diluted liquid onto the arm of his suit, where it had melted through. She wound tape around it as a seal. Carla leaned her head back against the wall. Okay, I guess we can stay here tonight. Tomorrow we'll try to find some transportation. Good. Carla, stay strong. Nearly home. Okay, same as before. Come in via Houston Mill Road. It's been modified to only accept certain visitors. No uninvited walk-ins anymore, I'm afraid. You'll come to a checkpoint. You're expected, so don't stop, don't get out. You'll simply be waved through. When you get to the terminus, you will need to leave the vehicle and proceed to the chemical showers. It'll be unpleasant, but it's the only way for us to be sure you're detoxed and clean. Fine with me. A shower is a shower. Megan doused a rag with some water and wiped her faceplate. Tomorrow it is, then, Carla said softly. Remember, do not stop, and do not get out of the car for any reason, no matter what you see. Stay safe, and good luck. Carla hung up. Matt sat forward. I'll board up the door in a minute. He lay back down, suddenly feeling dizzy, exhaustion eating away at every atom in his body. He closed his eyes. Chapter 23 Kurt stayed low amongst the shrubbery, a few hundred feet from the side of his house. His modest bungalow was on a large plot, just off Hall Road, in Wayne, New York. It was a little run down, but sat on a few acres of flat, secluded forest, and was as close to being in the country as he could get, on the outskirts of one of America's most populated cities. He had staked it out for an hour. He'd circled twice, and there'd been no movement inside at any time. He kept low and ran to the front door. There was nothing but darkness in the windows. The key was still under the potted plant. In one smooth motion, he unlocked the door, pushed it open, slid inside, and closed it behind him as silently as he could manage. Breathing hard, he stood against the wall in the darkness for another ten minutes, just listening, feeling for movement or a presence. It was his training as a hunter. Wait for your prey to move first. See them before they saw you. After several minutes, there was still nothing. He exhaled and dropped his heavy bag with a dull metallic clank. His shoulders immediately felt lighter by half. 
Kurt had been thinking about his priorities for hours before he had even arrived. Shower all this bug shit off, seal the windows and doors, and then make a giant meal, followed by ten hours sack time. Not one part of that sounded like a bad idea. His clothing came off first and went into a plastic bag, which he sealed. Naked, he went to his linen cupboard, grabbed some towels, wet them, and rolled them up. He placed them under door frames and along window ledges. Next, he placed cling wrap over air vents, keyholes, and any other entry or exit, no matter how small, that he could find. After another hour, he stood back and nodded. Nothing could get in, no matter how microscopic, unless he wanted it to. He raced to the shower, luxuriating in the water, bathing away the grease, grime, chemicals, and miles of shitty jungle. Scrubbed pink, he ambled out, still naked, and ran his large hands up through his hair. He stretched and smiled. He felt good. He opened the fridge, it was just as he had left it. There were a few long-life condiments and some rancid dairy products. Didn't matter. His pantry was stocked with tins and dry food. He always kept bulk supplies in case he got snowed in. If he ate wisely, he reckoned he could last six months. There'd be nothing to do but listen to the radio and wait. Kurt made himself a huge plate of tinned beans, ham, and tomatoes and grabbed two warm beers. He would have sat at the table and listened to the radio, but there was one last thing to be taken care of. He grabbed his satchel and dropped it onto the table. Reaching in carefully, he lifted free a few pieces of the ink and gold. He sat them on the table and brought his smiling face close. Each was polished and gleaming, as if it had been cast just yesterday. His smile broke into a grin at the collection. Hello, rich man. He picked up one of the largest pieces, a squat idol that leered madly at him. Same to you, fatso. He put it down and wiped his hands, taking a big spoonful of beans and ham. He continued removing the pieces, rummaging through the last items in his pack. He pushed aside the empty insecticide bottle. Won't need you again, he thought with satisfaction. His hand closed on a tiny piece of folded plastic. He lifted it carefully out. There was something shimmering inside. He frowned. He couldn't remember taking it with him or picking it up along the way. Kurt opened the small bag and reached in, pulling the iridescent feather free. He turned it in his fingers, confusion suddenly turning to recognition and then to horror. Oh, shit, shit, shit! He dropped the Archaeopteryx feather and held his wrist as if his hand had been burnt. He raced for the shower. Chapter 24 If the daytime was mostly devoid of the noises of city life, then the night belonged to the nocturnal denizens, long, noisy, and violent. Groups of people ran in the street, either in pursuit or being pursued. Sometimes an individual would creep by or pause to try their door. That was the worst. It could have been another Maddie seeking help or someone looking for an opportunity to loot, maim, or kill. And then there were the infested, those crawling with the parasite, skin drooping or sloughing off in wet blobs, and the others, those who had the mite but weren't showing symptoms, perhaps believing they were clean, unknowingly being turned into walking egg factories. Matt blinked eyes that were so gritty it hurt to close them. Tiredness hung on them all like lead weights, but no one could sleep well enough to get any relief. Matt held a small plastic flashlight, but refrained from using it. The light would have acted like a beacon to the rabid hordes outside. The morning came slowly, and breakfast was just like dinner. A few energy bars that they'd found on the counter, and rust-tasting tap water, 
all gratefully consumed. Matt's initial search of the drawers in the office had yielded little more than tape measures, invoice slips, a set of keys and some wrenches. Not a great haul. Eating was a challenge with the suits. Carla had her suit done up and over her head once again. Reed was still propped up, but this time his breathing was more like that of a deep sleeper, as opposed to a man fighting for his life. The wound still dripped and needed attention, but for now he lived. Reed coughed wetly and then groaned. Matt poured some water into a coffee mug and held it to the soldier's lips. He groaned again, took a sip, and grimaced. Shit, that hurt. Matt smiled. Welcome back. What happened? Where are we? His eyes stayed shut, and pain started to crease his features. You got shot, the ASV got torched, and we got chased by a mob. Now we're hiding in a plumbing supply store. But that was yesterday. He gave Reed another sip of water. Today we're going to head into the CDC. Think you can make it? Reed opened his eyes and started to nod. His eyes focused. Then came a look of panic. He grabbed Matt's forearm, sitting forward. Where the fuck is my suit? Am I covered? Matt pushed him down. Take it easy. You've got residual insecticide, so you should be okay for now. Your biggest issue is that you need a blood transfusion. You've got a punctured lung and a drip inserted into your chest. Reed's hand came up slowly, touching the small tube. He winced and then frowned. The girl, the bloomer, did she... Where is she? Matt kept his voice low, not wanting Carla to hear. She's gone. Did I shoot her? His face was pained. No, Matt responded. He nodded. I was going to. He opened his eyes. If she'd bloomed, we'd have all been fucked. Too late, Matt thought. Reed coughed, this time without blood appearing on his lips. He winced again. You know, the mites prefer the subdermal skin layers, but they're happy to munch on the cells of the mouth, throat, lungs, eat you from the inside out. Yeah, you said that. Take it easy now. Get some rest. Matt pressed the mug of water into his hands and stood. His stomach sank. He remembered hearing Carla cough in the night. He didn't want her falling to bits in front of them. He looked down at the soldier. Rest now. We'll be going soon, trying to find a car or something we can use to get to the CDC. Reed nodded. I'll be fine. I'll make it home even if I have to crawl. Matt hoped it wouldn't come to that. Carla found a small bathroom at the back of the shop and stood in front of a discolored mirror. She leaned forward, trying to see herself through her glass faceplate. She swore softly and unzipped the suit, pulling it back down off her shoulders, then dragged her hands up and out of the inbuilt gloves. She luxuriated in the coolness, her perspiration drying quickly. She snorted. Never had bathroom air smelt so sweet. She leaned forward once again and licked her lips. They felt funny, numb and puffy, just like her gums and throat. She grinned, showing her teeth and turning her head from side to side, noticing a slight swelling of her upper lip. She looked like she'd just had a round of collagen injections to give herself a Sunset Boulevard trout pout. She was tired, but felt better knowing they were going to be home soon. A long, hot shower, clean sheets, a cooked meal. Any one of those things seemed like such a luxury. There was a knock on the door. Carla, you okay in there? Sure, Matt, just finishing up. She washed her hands with soap, splashed water on her face, and then ran hands through her hair, scraping at her greasy scalp. 
She finished by slowly pulling the suit back up and zipping it closed. One more day, she thought. Matt opened the back door a crack and peered out. The morning was silent. No more people about, no birdsong, not even a breeze to stir up some sounds. He went out into the laneway and beheld a streetscape that looked like a third world war zone. Mountains of debris and rubbish piled high, wrecked cars, bikes, dead bodies, and animal carcasses. The smell was atrocious. Matt knew that only bacteria and insects would worry the dead. Even the rats would have succumbed to the mite by now. There were a few cars parked neatly in the laneway. The owners had probably finished work, gone indoors, and then vanished into some sort of twilight zone, never to return. Or perhaps they were watching him now. Matt looked along the windows, but there was no movement, nor any open or broken panes to suggest anything sinister. He ventured out farther. There was a single Ford truck with the same logo on the doors as on the shop they had taken shelter in. Matt tried the door, hopefully, then dropped his hand. He turned to Megan and Carla, who were standing in the doorway, holding Reed between them. Wait a minute. He charged back past them, and in a few seconds returned with the keys he had found earlier. He opened the truck's door, and on seeing the two-way radio, whispered a soft, Thank you. Come on, it's got half a tank. He leapt out and ran around to help with Reed. Together they pushed him into the cabin. Matt pointed to the radio. Carla, see if you can get Dr. Hewson again. You bet. She smiled and jumped in. Matt paled. Through the faceplate, he noticed the blood on her teeth. Eat you from the inside out, Reed had said. The soldier slumped, moving in and out of consciousness. The drip at his chest was now leaking a discolored fluid. Without any more antibiotics, the man had days, maybe hours left. Megan slammed the door. Know how to drive this big sucker? Matt blew air through his lips dismissively. It's a Ford F-750 with a 210 horsepower engine. She laughed. Okay, that's written on the dash. Can you drive it? She raised her eyebrows. Sure, the F-750 is an automatic. That's all I need to know. He fired it up, and the roar was loud in the dead back street. He jumped it forward, plowing through or pushing over small mountains of rubbish and other things he didn't want to dwell on. They turned onto the main road and he accelerated, following Carla's directions to CDC headquarters. Matt moved down streets, turning left or right on Carla's instructions. The morning was as silent as the night had been noisy, the running and screaming denizens of the darkness now home, comatose, or dead. But empty as the streets were, Matt still couldn't shake the feeling that behind the doors and windows, eyes followed their progress. At the next junction, they had to stop at a wall of trucks, topped with cars. In some places, the pile of broken steel, glass, and rubber had been lashed together with cargo netting. It was no random pile-up, but a physical barrier created to keep someone in or out. I don't like it. Matt glanced around quickly, looking out the truck's windows. Carla folded her arms. Hugh should have told us about this. I don't think he knew. Look. Matt pointed to one of the cars, which was leaking oil, the dark fluid running down to the ground where a pool glistened, not yet soaked in. This has just been erected. Last night, Megan leaned forward. Probably. The question is, was it built for us? Matt turned to her, eyebrows raised. He wound down the window and leaned out, raising himself up slightly. From outside the window there was near total silence, 
from a street that used to be crammed with hundreds of cars and pedestrians going about their daily business only weeks before. Matt turned back to them. Like a tomb. Suddenly, an explosion of sound hammered the air around them, making them cringe as if from a physical blow. Loud speakers blared all around them. Music, screams, a cacophony of jumbled sounds, then a screech of white noise made them grind their teeth and squeeze their eyes shut. The sounds flattened and organized, becoming a rapper's backbeat. Into it came a voice, deep and stentorian, the perfect vowels incongruous among the thumping, scratching, musical beat of the street. This is the end of days, the end of your life. Matt wrenched himself back into the car. What the hell is that? This is a bad joke. He had to shout over the music. Move, let's get out of here. Back up, go, go, go. Megan had her hands over her ears. Matt put the car in reverse and accelerated. Say goodbye to your husband. Say goodbye to your wife. Matt grimaced. Carla kept her head down and her eyes shut. You caused all this when you took our skins. Now all off to hell for your terrible sins. Shut up! Carla's voice was loud in the cabin, and as if by magic the music shut off, leaving a ringing in their ears. It was immediately replaced by the urbane voice of Dylan. Carla. Carla Nero. It took me a while, but I knew I recognized you. Come to me, Carla. I have a lot to talk to you about. What? Carla's eyes were wide. Not today, asshole. Matt spun the car around and jammed his foot down hard on the accelerator, but evading the voice was impossible. Every corner seemed to have a speaker, on a street pole, hammered into walls, even affixed to abandoned cars. Don't make me hurt them, Carla, and I can hurt them, you'll see. Carla pointed, her voice high. Go left at the next street. Matt spun the wheel and bounced down the street. The music started again. This is the end of your world. The words became harsher, louder, and finally they stopped making sense at all and just became an animalistic roar that could have emanated from the bowels of hell itself. The grotesque song receded as they powered ahead, Matt only just noticing how his heartbeat felt like a hammer behind his ribs. God damn it, he's watching us. He must be close, or his followers are. Megan's eyes darted as she stared through the windscreen. Turn again here. We've got to get back on track. At least this heads us in the right direction. Carla pointed. And again, here. We should be past the barrier now. Matt turned and immediately jammed his foot on the brake, skidding the big truck and throwing them all forward. Shit! There was a row of upside-down crucifixes. Men and women were tied to them, also upside down. They hung limp and were soaking wet. Reed moaned, and his arm came up slowly, pointing. Oh, God! Our people! His head slumped back, his face a mask of anguish. There was a crackle of static, and then came the smooth voice again. Get out of the truck, Carla. Matt put the truck in reverse, but before he could stamp on the accelerator, a figure dashed out, holding a flaming torch. He ran past the line of crucified people, touching each gently with the flame. One by one the figures exploded into pillars of orange fire and greasy black smoke. It was obvious now what they were soaked in. Gasoline. Several of the figures thrashed in the flames, tormented souls each in their own personal column of hell. Carla wailed. God, oh God, they're still alive! There was a deep sigh over the loudspeakers. I warned you, Carla. You made me hurt them. 
Don't make me hurt your friends as well. I can't let him... Carla's hand went to the door, and Megan wrapped her arms around her, screaming to Matt, Get us the fuck out of here! Matt pulled the truck back, bouncing off a curb and crashing into a parked car. He turned hard, pushing another vehicle out of the way. Carla, you need to direct me. This is a nightmare. I'm going to be sick. Matt accelerated. The music exploded at them again. And this time Dylan's calm voice was ripped away, his cultivated and sophisticated mask slipping to reveal a glimpse of the real being that hid beneath the refined exterior. Stop! Get out of the car, bitch! I'll fucking kill you all! I'll burn you down! I'll pull you apart and eat your faces! I'll... I... 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 The words boiled back together, mushing again into the monstrous roar. Matt gritted his teeth and crushed his eyes shut for a moment, trying to rid his mind of the insane voice and of the images of burning men and women. Carla was right. This was a nightmare, and they were stuck in it. Just drive. Carla's voice was devoid of life. Just drive, drive, drive. He repeated the words, using them as a mantra to blot everything else from his mind as he pushed the truck to the max down the debris-strewn street. Megan let go of Carla and sat back. I used to like R.E.M., A calm voice came over the radio. We have you in sight now, Dr. Nero. Keep coming. There are no more roadblocks or militias in view. Thank God. Matt slowed a little as he turned into the Houston Mill Road. He could see the military's influence on the facility. The whole block had been barricaded off and was heavily militarized, with gun turret towers and rotating searchlights. Martial law and then some, he thought. As they slowly rolled toward the huge walls, guards wearing similar suits to theirs rolled back the ten-foot-high chain-link outer gates. Each of the men had body armor, a semi-automatic weapon over his shoulder, and a sidearm. Just inside the gates there were more figures with field glasses trained on them. Houston Mill Road had also been altered. Gone were the wide-open spaces leading to the large factory-like building. The road was fenced on each side. A combination of brickwork, metal grating, and chain link forced all approaching vehicles onto a narrow path, one that could be scrutinized and defended if necessary. Matt observed that the rolling lawns at the front of the building were covered in row after row of temporary tents. It seemed the staff had taken to spending their nights in from now on. They slowed at the next checkpoint. This one preceded a long, barn-like structure which they entered. A voice came over the radio, telling them to stay in their vehicle. Another person in a hazmat suit appeared beside them and used a pressure spray to blast the truck with foaming liquid. Once complete, another figure appeared in front of them, with two orange aircraft runway-type batons, and waved them on, pointing to a large yellow circle in the next section of the building. Matt stopped the truck within it, and a booming voice requested that they step out, hands on their heads. Matt came first. He waved, indicating that he needed a moment, and then turned to take one of Reed's arms. Megan slid out, holding the other. They could barely tell if he was breathing anymore. Last came Carla, wheezing wetly. The men directed them to different stalls, men on one side, women on the other. Matt handed Reed to some suited soldiers who carefully carried him into the stall. Matt was ordered to strip off. He emptied his pockets of anything he wanted to keep. Those items would be separately cleansed. The clothing and his suit were sealed into a bag which was immediately taken away. The shower was hot, highly chemical, and had enough pressure behind it to scour the skin. Matt was given a tough bristled brush and instructed to scrub, hard. 
He was sure he lost eyebrows and some of the hair on his head. Not that it mattered. His long hair was shaved, along with his eyebrows, underarms, and pubic area. He ran a hand up over his head. The smooth scalp felt weird, but liberating. He was given a set of paper coveralls and was ordered to pass down a long, plastic-lined walkway to an ultraviolet room for five minutes, and then into another room for a checkup. The room was long and white, like a sterile hospital room, with little more than sheetless cots and steel benches with portable lights overhead. The men and women working here were without hazmat suits, but still wore all-over disposable suits and face masks. Guess we're not quite out of the woods yet, Matt thought. The door opened, and in came Megan and Carla, their heads shaven and scrubbed pink. Matt smiled and saluted Megan. G.I. Jane, maybe? Megan grinned back. More like space oddity. Man, you have one weird-shaped head, Kearns. Behind her, Carla looked shrunken. Without her mane of hair, her face looked lined, her head way too small. She coughed, the single sound freezing the room. An attendant backed up. Don't move. Dr. Nero, have you had your suit off at any time? Miserably, Carla nodded. And I think I've got a rash. God damn it! The three men and two women seemed frozen in indecision. One, Dr. Jackson, according to his name tag, looked to Matt and Megan and pointed. What about you two? Matt shook his head. Megan did the same. Jackson seemed to decide. Okay, don't worry, Dr. Nero. We're going to have to give you some internal treatments and keep you isolated for a little longer. Please return to the previous sterilization room. He watched her head out and then turned to Matt and Megan. You two can proceed to the change rooms. Megan shook her head. No, we'd like to stay if that's okay. She went to follow Carla, but she turned to her and held up her hand. No, Megan, Matt, you stay. I'll be fine. She smiled. Besides, this may take a while. She waved to them. I'm a tough old thing. I'm not dead yet, and I don't intend to be any time soon. She looked past them and pointed to the small container that held the two vials of red fluid. Jackson, get those to Francis Hewson right now, and then have him contact me. Jackson nodded. You got it. Carla stepped back into the corridor. Megan turned to the attendants. What will happen to her? She'll become a skinner or a bloomer unless you stop it, right? The man grunted. Stop it? We can't stop it. We can slow it down, but for just a while, it's always fatal. But if she's a bloomer, they live longer, don't they? He shrugged, and Megan literally growled at his indifference. She spoke through gritted teeth. Hey! That is Dr. Carla Nero. She just goddamn trekked through the Amazon jungle to find a cure for you, us, all of us. The least you could do is answer some goddamn questions. There was silence for several seconds. Well? Megan screamed. Two soldiers appeared. Jackson waved them away. She's right. They have a right to know. He looked back to Megan. She's our friend, too. There was both sadness and resignation on his face. What you've heard about bloomers is unfortunately all true. When a pregnant alpha female mite infests a body, it sends out a chemical signal that alters the sex of all the other mites. In effect, they all become females. Insects and arthropods have some wonderful adaptive abilities. He drew in a breath and seemed to sag. The mites stop their voracious pursuit of the subcutaneous dermal layers and instead start producing egg pouches. 
They produce millions and millions of them, swelling the skin and forming an amniotic gas that generates the distinctive nursery pockets, blisters. When the skin reaches its maximum tension point, or in response to some unknown prescribed signal, the gas causes the vesicles to explode, throwing the mite larvae into the atmosphere. A normal plume can float for days and cover several miles. Matt nodded, looking down at his feet. Yes, we've seen someone with the lumps, recently. Jackson kept his eyes on Megan. Unfortunately, it doesn't always end there. The mites continue to lay and burst for many days. As more eggs are laid, more of the body becomes infested, inside and out. The human body is a wonderfully elastic vehicle, but eventually it loses its ability to contain the billions of larvae. Eventually the body will explode and collapse. The remains need to be incinerated, as even the exploded host can continue to give off mite clouds for weeks afterwards. He looked at each of them. We'll do what we can, but appreciate what we are dealing with here. This is not just about one doctor, no matter how important. Millions are dead, and millions more will die. He turned and continued down the corridor. Matt and Megan followed in silence. Dylan lowered the heavy field glasses, his eyes narrowing as he surveyed the huge fortified complex. We offered them nothing more than our love and the chance to see how much better they can be. He turned and handed the heavy binoculars to the rapt man beside him. And in turn they erect the walls of Jericho to keep us out. So be it. Then I will be Joshua and blow them down. He made a fist. Bring them in. Bring them all in. It is time. Kurt sneezed, not bothering to wipe the red-brown liquid that ran from his nose. Still naked after his shower, he sat on the floor, propped up against a kitchen cupboard. Empty tins of insect spray rolled around next to him, and his skin glistened with their poisons. The first lumps had appeared on his wrist a few hours ago, and from then more had appeared along his arm and then over his chest, making him look like a two-legged alligator. He laughed wetly as he spotted the golden idol on the tabletop. Should have listened to Kearns, he grinned. Curse of the Incas, right? He ran his fingertips over his cheeks, feeling the pea-sized bumps on his face. Is it too late to apologize? He nodded as if listening. No? Never too late? He groaned as he pulled himself to his feet. Okay, then. Kurt shuffled to a drawer and retrieved a box, some plastic padding, and some tape. He lined the box with the plastic and then placed the gold carefully inside, looking at each item, rubbing it once or twice with his thumb. He closed his eyes for a second or two, or so he thought, and then sealed the box. He wrote carefully on the lid with a thick, felt-tipped pen, simply addressing it to the Brazilian consulate. He left the grinning idol on the tabletop. You get to stay with me. I'm adopting you. He looked at his wristwatch. It had taken him over an hour to perform the simple task. Time was losing all meaning. He reached up to feel his face again and quickly recoiled. His nose was misshapen and his cheekbones were bloated and threatening to close his eyes. There go my boyish good looks. Kurt went to turn and grunted with the effort. His legs now resembled pipes covered in popcorn, and his knees refused to bend. He went to carry the box to the door and caught sight of his hands. He swallowed the urge to cry out. Time jumped again, and when he opened his eyes he found himself back down on the floor. It was dark outside. The idol stared down at him 
grinning, always grinning. Did you push me? Kurt nodded, listening again. You're goddamn right, it's funny. He looked down at his body, wishing he had something to cover himself up with, worried now about what people would think when they found him. Disgusting. He shook his head. Doesn't hurt, though. He lay down, exhausted beyond words. He was thirsty, but doubted he'd be able to get to his feet to drink some water. Kurt Douglas exhaled slowly. I had a pretty good life, you know, he said, trying to smile, but unsure if his lips could do that anymore. Gonna rest now. He closed his eyes. See you in the morning. The Bell Kiowa Scout helicopter looped high over the Atlanta skyline. A military observation chopper with a distinctive mast-mounted sight that resembled a beach ball perched above its single rotor, it had object density scanning and infrared and thermal imaging. With its light skeletal design, it could scout night and day on very little fuel. From a distant rooftop there came the flash of a reflection. Corporal Corey Jones, a pilot of four years, would have ignored it, but it came again, this time in a pattern. She opened her mic. Atlanta base, this is Jones in BC-447. I've got a pattern flasher signaling me from a rooftop downtown. Request permission to take a look-see. After a few moments, a deep, laconic voice came back. BC-447, permission granted to drop to 200 feet only. There was a pause. No passengers or strays today, Jones. We've got work to do. Jones grinned. You got it, Pop. Two hundred feet confirm. Over. The Kiowa sped like a steel mosquito to the line of buildings, dropping to three hundred feet as it came. As an afterthought, Jones switched to density imaging and then dropped another hundred feet. A warning sounded from the cockpit console, and she frowned. Multiple metallic signatures. Jones looped around the building and then sucked in a breath. The street behind was filled with people, all streaming in the direction of the Atlanta CDC compound. Most were on foot, but there were some small trucks in amongst the group. Many of the people appeared to be armed. At their center was a huge vehicle with a long, drab metal crate structure on its back. Jones started the onboard cameras. Photographs were taken and sent home automatically. What is that? she wondered, as she dropped down another fifty feet. Then the details became clear. Holy shit! She pulled up hard. Base, emergency! Come in, emergency! There was another flash from the rooftop. This one made the cockpit sensors go berserk. Jones's heart pounded hard in her chest as she saw the display. Incoming heat signature. She pulled away, willing the small chopper to outpace the approaching dot of heat. Please, please, please! Corey Jones looked over her shoulder. The flaring dot straightened as it found her and locked on. She recognized it now, a rocket-propelled grenade, and knew it was coming at her at nearly six hundred feet per second. Come back, Jones. Say again. The voice had lost its laid-back tone. No! The Kiowa jinked and then dove. The RPG followed. The small helicopter exploded, raining debris and fire down upon the streets. Major Bennings thrust open the door and strode into the command center. Cohen, give me what you got. The assembled soldiers at their makeshift communication and surveillance desks looked up briefly then went back to their multiple screens. An officer raced over, pointing at a large wall display. Sir, one of our surveillance birds was just shot out of the sky. They managed to send back some images. He pointed at the screen. They've got an army, and it's coming in on the western side of the city. 
Organized? Doesn't look like it, but certainly armed. They've got automatic assault rifles and RPGs. Bennings cursed under his breath. Where the hell did they get an army, or all their kit? He shook his head, standing close to the screen. Probably us. Doesn't matter. Can we get another bird up? We can't risk it. They've got M-72 anti-tank RPGs, and after our chopper was hit, we assume they got the heat-seeking upgrade. We need higher altitude, and for that we need one of Bragg's birds. It'd take hours to get here. They'll be in our front yard by then. Bennings looked at the younger officer and nodded. Show me what we do have. Cohen advanced the images. Several more were displayed, many taken from bad angles as the helicopter dove or banked. But the picture was clear enough. Thousands of troops with weapons held high, the smaller vehicles in amongst all the bandaged bodies, and then partially obscured the huge truck. Hold it. Enlarge that one. Benning stepped forward. The image was grainy, but it showed an enormous truck with a long mounting on its back in four distinct sections. Cohen slumped. For fuck's sake, is that what I think it is? Bennings exhaled slowly. Yep, Patriot Launcher. Looks to have four in the pipes. He rubbed a hand up over his face and then through his cropped hair. The technicians that were taken the other day, were there any launch specialists in amongst them? Cohen sat down. Yes, sir. Several. Chapter 25 So, how's your day been? Francis Hewson came into the room in a bulky suit, with a massive lump at the back, indicating it had its own air supply. He smiled at her from behind the Perspex visor. Carla stood. Hey, I leave you in charge of the country and you break it? What gives? Her words were slurred and she grinned, the blood on her teeth causing him to wince. I'd give you a hug, but, well, you know. He nodded. I've got our best people running tests on your solution. Magnificent stuff and nothing we've ever seen before. From a vine, you say? She nodded and coughed, turning away. From a flowered vine that probably came from the dawn of time. Maybe it's a representative of the very first vine, along with everything else in that crazy place. She looked up at him. I hope it works. So do I, he said. And I hope its toxicity is minimal. We need to get it inside you as well. Doesn't matter to me, if it's toxic, I mean. I'd rather die from poison in a few minutes than end up slowly turning into... She shook her head and sighed. I can feel them inside, or rather I can't anymore. My lips, gums, throat, they're all numb. Now I know what Sergeant Reed meant when he tried to warn us. She looked up and grinned sheepishly. But I never listen. You never have, Hugh smiled back sadly. How is he? Carla asked. Reed's okay. You did a good job cleaning the wound. He's been given blood and antibiotics, but there are bullet shards embedded in the wall of his heart. He'll need a delicate operation, one we can't do here. For now, he'll get by. Carla looked anxious. Is he... Hugh shook his head. He's clean. From what Matt and Megan told me, you took the full viral blast from the bloomer. You inhaled the larvae, and, well, we need to deal with that. I need to get to work. He held up his hand. No, you need to... I need to get to work. Put me in a suit, keep me in isolation, but I need to help with the analysis, synthesis, and distribution. This is too important. Use me while you're still able. He looked at her, grimacing, but she knew he couldn't disagree with her. Look, there's no argument about needing you. He turned away, torn. From a toxicological specialization standpoint, there's no one better. 
She reached up to the shoulder of his suit and slowly turned him back toward her. Hugh, we need to hurry. Indecision is what will kill us all now. He nodded slowly. Perhaps we can rig up some sort of suit for you to allow you to work and keep you in your own personal isolation. But it'll have to be from outside. We can't afford to let a bloomer, uh, someone infested, into the building. Carla nodded. I agree and fully understand. Set up a remote link and get me a headset so we can stay in continual contact. He smiled and shook his head. Why will I need a headset when I'll be right here beside you? He shrugged. Besides, you know as well as I do that if this fails, it'll only be a matter of time before we're all dead. A klaxon horn sounded, making both scientists flinch. Carla gritted her teeth and turned to him. Contamination? Is it a breach? Hugh shook his head. I don't think so. Something else. There was a soft popping sound from outside the laboratory, followed by a deep thump that made the equipment rattle and white dust sprinkled down upon them. What the hell? Wait here. Hugh raced out of the room. Bennings watched through high-powered binoculars as the massive mobile launcher was driven to the distant end of Houston Mill Road. It pulled in behind an abandoned bus, and the four-sectioned box was lifted to clear the bus's body. Bennings groaned. Machine gun fire rang out, and a few RPGs looped toward their compound, falling well short. They didn't matter. It was the launcher that gave him the cement-like feeling deep in his gut. He knew that each of those four sections housed a deadly surface-to-air missile, 20 feet long and weighing over 1,500 pounds apiece. He brought the drab green launcher into focus. Shit. Looks like an MIM-104. Proximity fuse and a full bank of high-explosive fragmentation missiles. Those bad boys will reach Mach 5 a second after launch, and if it's a PSAC-3, then it's got a laser guidance system that can place one between your eyes. He lowered the glasses. Just one of those will punch a hole right through this building like cheese. Four of them, and we're going to end up sitting in a crater. He turned to Cohen. What have we got at our disposal? RPGs, some high-cal sniper rifles, and plenty of M16A2s, but they're... Yeah, I know. They're out of our range, but we're not out of theirs. We need to execute a frontal assault, but trying to engage armed hostiles while we're stuck inside hazmat suits will be suicide, and fighting without them will be even worse. So let's hear your best plan B. Cohen looked back at the screen and shook his head. There's only one, and it's not a good one. Bennings nodded. We've got to go out, but not in force. We need a small team. The smallest. Maybe one man, perhaps one with nothing to lose. Bennings sighed. God damn, I hate this part. He looked back at the missile launcher. It had swung around toward them. They'll be talking to us soon, a list of demands. Whatever they want, just keep them talking and buy us some time. Bennings sat on the edge of Reed's bed. The soldier looked remarkably well, given the trauma he had suffered to his chest. Reed shrugged. I feel fine, sir. I'm ready for duty. Bennings patted his forearm. You've got a bullet fragment embedded in your ventricle wall. He shook his head but held the young man's gaze. It's not good, son. You feel fine because I ordered them to give you enough steroids, adrenaline, and chemical stimulants to take on the entire Russian track team. Go juice. Reed lifted his hands and flexed his fists. He dropped them and looked at his superior officer. It's not over, is it, sir? Benning stood and straightened his jacket. No, son. The nightmare keeps coming right to our front door. You've done a lot for us, more than most. 
But I need to ask you something, something real hard. Feel free to tell me to go to hell at any time. I'll do it. You don't know what I'm going to ask you. Reed smiled without humor. I heard the gunfire and the larger impacts. The barbarians are at the gate, at our front door, right? Can't let him in, can we, sir? Reed threw his legs over the side of the bed and winced. What do you need me to do? Bennings reached out and gave Reed his arm, steadying him as he stood. I need you to walk into Satan's parlor and blow him back to hell. Reed gripped the older soldier's arm. With pleasure. Dylan sat in the cabin of the mobile launcher behind a busy console, with multiple screens for radar, targeting, guidance, and arming initiators. None were active. He leaned forward to look through the windscreen and down at the three captured soldiers handcuffed together. They were still in their hazmat suits, for now. He sighed. Once more into the breach. He let his fingers walk along the console, flicked on the radio, and sat back. Hello again, my dear Captain Cohen. I love you dearly, but I do hope you have finished boring me. My request is simple, so simple I'm sure even someone like you can appreciate its clarity. Send out all army personnel holding their weapons over their heads. Those who choose to approach, naked and ready to embrace our flock, will be immediately accepted into our group. The others will be kept safe as our guests. He licked his raw lips. Our warm and tender guests. He laughed softly. Oh, and if your men decide to come out firing, we will launch a Patriot. Just one. I may decide to launch another. We have plenty, you know. I believe you, Mr. Dillon. Can the men and women cover up their genitals for, uh, modesty? Dillon shook his head. Modesty? Did you say modesty? Dylan let his head fall back for a moment. Your scientists have polluted our world and turned people into the living dead, and you ask us to accommodate your bashfulness? He felt his anger rising. Your entire revolting framework of skin and hair disgusts me. Maybe I should help you overcome your shyness, a demonstration of our power. Cohen's hurried voice filled the cabin again. No, no, please, Mr. Dillon, we believe you. But you only asked for the soldiers to come out. What about all the medical, scientific, and administrative personnel we have in here? Dillon clenched his fist and squeezed. You mean those who created this, started this, and now work to develop something even worse? Oh, I have plans for them, my dear man. He closed his eyes and smiled. They stay right where they are and await my arrival. Okay, Mr. Dillon, that's a lot to action and may take some time to organize. How about silence? Dillon sat forward. You want time? How about I give you one hour? Then in one hour and ten seconds I'll fire a missile. Maybe two or three to show you how patient I am. After that, I'll have my people walk in and scoop what's left of you all into buckets. How does that sound? I need more time. There are hundreds of men and women. I need one hour and then boom. Your choice. Dylan leaned forward and waved down at the three handcuffed soldiers. Got to go now, Captain. I have got some job applicants to interview. Toodaloo. He flicked off the microphone. The three men, cuffed wrist to wrist, were led to Dylan. He held up his hands in elaborate disappointment. Please uncuff our guests. They must be so uncomfortable. And let's all stand near the fire to keep warm. He looked each man over as he walked along the line. 
Two were youngish. The third was older, perhaps in his forties. Dylan stopped and lifted the chin of one, peering into the faceplate. Hmm, not even a whisker yet. Nice. He continued to the older man. He was the only one to meet Dylan's eyes, challenging, full of fight. Good, Dylan thought. Papers were handed to Dylan, and he flipped through them, nodding and hmming as he paced. He pointed a finger at each man as though ticking them off a list. Excellent. All here. He went back to the youthful soldier and stood before him. The young man stared at the ground. Dylan reached up and began to unwind the bandages from his head, slowly gathering the stained material into a sodden bundle as his face was exposed. Look at me. The young soldier slowly looked up and sucked in his breath. Dylan was little more than a glistening skull, all exposed muscle and tendon. His eyes were lidless, giving his eyeballs a hellish popping stare that was now fixed on the young man. Dylan leaned in close. Do you think I'm pretty? The young man's head went down again. Dylan reached out and lifted his chin. I think you already know what I want. Tell them nothing. The older soldier strained against the bandaged men holding him. Dylan crossed to him, glancing briefly down at the papers in his hand. We already know nearly everything. He pointed at the older man's chest. Captain Alfred Rogers, nice to make your acquaintance. Dylan grinned like a red skull. He pointed at the next young man in line. First Lieutenant Aaron Goldberg, targeting and logistics. Very pleased to meet you. Then to the last man. And Second Lieutenant Ben Lynn, administration and security. Dylan gave him his best horror show grin. Or should I say administration and launch codes? Happy days. You and young Goldberg are very important to me. He turned to Rogers. But you? Not so much. For now I'll simply refer to you as motivation. Dylan's grin fell away. I want the launch codes to the missiles, and I want the laser targeting unlocked and assigned to my authority. You will do that for me. Go to hell! Rogers lunged again, pulling away from the men holding him and then falling at Dylan's feet. Dylan put his boot on the back of Rogers' head. My dear captain, you stopped being in charge the moment you and your men fell into my possession. He lifted his boot and motioned for Rogers to be lifted. Dylan looked into the captain's faceplate as he rewound the bandages over his face. Go to hell? You first. Dylan motioned to the fire, and Captain Rogers was ripped out of his suit. His wrists and ankles were bound with rope. Struggling, he was pulled down flat and then lifted onto the flames. His hair burnt away in a flash of sparks, and within a few moments greasy smoke carried the smell of cooking meat. Hmm, anyone else feeling hungry? Rogers thrashed and writhed in maddening pain. After another few moments, Dylan motioned for him to be lifted free. The older soldier was held upright, his body in an unconscious slump. Dylan turned to Goldberg and Lynn. It is not me that tortures or binds you. It is your fears and your pain. He pulled a lighter from his pocket and held the flame under his chin. The skin smoked, crackled, and hissed, but still Dylan didn't flinch. At last he pulled it away. We are free from pain. We are the enlightened. But you, and even you, he motioned to Rogers, you will all endure untold horrors until you give me what I want. He waited. Ready to help? The soldiers kept their heads down. Goldberg sobbed quietly. 
Not yet? Dylan shrugged and then made a twirling motion with one hand. Rogers was spun around to face the fire. Goldberg looked up and cried out at the sight of his captain's back. Are you sure you don't want to help? Captain Rogers won't thank you, you know. Dylan spoke to the bandaged figures holding the ropes. Wake him up. A bucket of water was thrown in Rogers' face. Rogers shook his head, sucked in a long breath, and then screamed for what seemed like ages. By the way, Goldberg, you're next. Rogers was lifted and angled over the flames. Once again he screamed and thrashed. Dylan pulled out a gun and pointed it at the back of the captain's head. Fast death or slow burn, the money or the gun? He grinned. Here we go. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six. Goldberg wailed, his eyes crushed shut. Help! Please help! Help us! No one answered, other than some laughter from the swarms of bandaged men and women witnessing their leader's interview techniques. Dylan shook his head. Dearest Aaron, there's just us here, no one else. We're all alone this day, dear boy. Now where was I? Oh, yes. Five, four, three. Please. Lynn kept his eyes on the ground. Two, one. Dylan turned back to Rogers. Stop. Pardon me? I didn't catch that. Dylan lowered the gun. Lynn's voice was barely a whisper. Please stop. I'll help. Don't say a fucking thing, soldier. Roger's words sounded wet and tortured. Dylan turned back to him and flicked his hand. The captain was dropped face down onto the flames. His screams seemed endless. Goldberg fainted, and Lynn fell to his knees. Dylan quickly knelt before him, the sound of Roger's hellish torment filling the air. End it. Please end it. Don't let this happen to young Goldberg as well. I beg you. He placed his hands on Lynn's shoulders. The young man nodded, his eyes squeezed closed. Dylan hugged him. Good. Boy, he stroked his head through the hazmat suit. Good, good boy. Dylan stood and shot Rogers in the head. His body immediately stopped moving. Now unlock those patriots, enter the launch codes, and assign all targeting authority to me, right now. The soldiers nodded. Dylan grunted and looked at the now still body grilling on the flames. Dinner is served. Carla sat slumped in the empty laboratory. The sound of explosions had ceased, but Hugh was yet to return. Her gaze was directed to a few pea-sized lumps on the back of her hand. She prodded one. There was no pain, no itch or irritation at all. In fact, her skin now felt like it belonged to someone else. She pressed it again. It was like a blister, but without fluid, just raised skin. But she knew it wasn't empty. It was a brood chamber for hundreds, if not thousands, of young parasites. Her body would produce countless more extrusions like these. They would swell until they burst. She was a walking biological time bomb. She swallowed, feeling some constriction in her throat. Just nerves, she hoped, but she tried hard not to think about what was going on inside her body. Carla Nero dropped her hands and closed her eyes. Soon, Maddie. See you soon. Reed had exited the Atlanta CDC building via one of the service tunnels, coming up a block behind the massive ash gray edifice. He staggered. The extra weight he carried was heavy but he still needed to walk several miles. Even though the chemicals he'd been given gave him near superhuman strength and endurance, 
the effect would be fleeting. He had an hour max, and then he'd simply collapse. He would need every second. Reed wore a bulky longshoreman's coat that finished above knees wrapped in loose sheeting. His hands and head were likewise covered, the cloth stained with brown, red, and ochre colors. He hoped the camouflage would allow him to infiltrate the bedraggled creatures that had gathered to witness the fall of the CDC stronghold. Rounding one last corner, he saw them. The fires burning, the dancing and gyrating bodies, like a tribe of primitives performing a war dance prior to an attack. The Patriot launcher stood like a colossus at their center. Its bank of four missiles were raised and aimed, and hopefully armed. If they were already primed, then an impact could set them off. That's what Patriots did, proximity detonate. Reed said a silent prayer of hope. A large fire burned close to the launcher, with what looked like a boar or some other large animal being roasted upon it. People reached over coals to pull bits of cooked meat from its bones. He looked up to the truck's cabin. There were three figures inside, two in army fatigues with what looked like hazmats pulled down to their waists. Two of the missing technicians, he bet. The third person inside was large and wrapped in bandages. The man's very demeanor spoke of power and dominance. Reed had found his goal. He lifted his pace. In a few minutes, he entered the throng. Even with his nose wrapped, the smell was horrendous. Rotting flesh, body odor, and the coppery scent of blood mixed with excrement. It was like the final party of the damned souls of hell, just waiting for the gates to open. Reed pushed through the crowd, his bandages making him invisible amongst the revelers, who were all similarly covered, or naked, skinless, and gleaming with leaking fluids. He approached the massive truck, stopping just before the fire. He grimaced when he saw what was cooking over the flames, then lowered his head and swallowed, a dry lump of fear in his gut. The body's limbs had been stripped of meat, and now the masses reached in to pull handfuls of charred flesh from its back. Reed growled in his chest, his disgust and anger peaking. He hated them, all of them. These weren't people anymore. The parasite had taken more than their skin. It had taken every last scrap of their humanity. He pushed on, covering the final few hundred feet and approaching the last barrier. A ring of large men surrounded the truck. He needed to get through them, to get inside, closer to Dylan. The men were insignificant, but the Patriot missile launcher had enough shielding to protect Dylan from what he had planned. Reed paused for only a second or two, a plan forming in his mind. He walked to the vehicle's front and fell to his knees. From his coat pocket he withdrew a jewel-encrusted crucifix. Major Bennings had given it to him, ripped from the CDC chapel. At the time he thought it was simply intended as a talisman to strengthen his resolve. Now he knew different. Reed held the cross high and yelled up at the truck, his eyes on the heavens. Father of fathers, you have once again sent your son to us. Praise be to you. Dylan's head came around, the words obviously resonating with him. He craned forward to peer down at Reed. He has sent Dylan to us, the old father's son. I have proof that the blessing is upon us. Dylan waved, nodding. Reed continued, warming to his role. Bless me, for you truly are he, Jesus Christ. Dylan nodded some more, clapping now. He opened his arms wide. The crowd had stopped and turned. Reed stood and approached the truck's huge door, holding out the crucifix before him. The men went to stop him but Dylan impatiently waved them aside. The Son of God is amongst us. I know it. Reed swallowed, easier now, a calm coming over him as the huge door swung open. He climbed up. 
The atmosphere inside was fetid and warm. Beside Dylan, the soldiers watched with dead eyes, already resigned to their fate. Reed sat down. Dylan was a big man, and swathed in bandages, he seemed even bigger. He dominated the truck's cabin. You called me a name. I feel it is right. I have often wondered whether... Dylan momentarily closed his eyes and crossed his arms over his bandaged chest. No. No, I don't wonder. I know. It is truly who I am. His son, come to save the world once again. Reed pulled the truck door closed behind him and quietly locked it. He looked at the console, noting that the launch screens were working, but unable to tell if the codes had been entered. Turning it from a dead, multi-ton structure of steel, electronics, and chemicals into four massive bombs. He looked across to the soldiers. Their eyes were defeated, their spirits extinguished. He needed them. Dylan took the crucifix from Reed and held it up before his face. Once I died on the cross for you. He looked at Reed the bandages around his mouth folding into the semblance of a smile. I will not make that mistake again. This time I will live to rule a world changed forever. Now you said you had proof of who I truly am. Tell me. Reed leaned around Dylan. Soldiers, are the MIM 104s armed? Both young men swung around at the military authority in his voice. Dylan lowered the crucifix, looking from Reed to the soldiers. What? Reed raised his voice. Soldiers, do the Patriots have proximity detonation capability? The younger soldier's head came up, his back erect. Sir, yes, sir, we have full detonation capabilities. What are your orders? Dylan lowered the cross. Who are you? He grabbed at Reed, pulling him forward. Reed's coat tore open, and Dylan sucked in a breath. His popping eyes seemed about to leave his skull. Reed's entire torso was strung with M67 grenades. The dull green spherical balls each contained six and a half ounces of Composition B explosive. Reed now knew that the missiles were armed to detonate if they suffered an impact. The grenades would deliver that impact. Dylan, along with every one of his foul creatures, would be obliterated. Reed grinned at him. What would Jesus do? He pulled on a single wire looping across all the firing mechanisms. It slid free. They had three seconds. Dylan leapt for the opposite door, but the soldiers blocked his exit, their faces alive and split with grins of triumph. Time to go, the younger one said. Dylan turned back to Reed, his fist flying. Reed grabbed him, held on, and pulled Dylan's eye-popping face close to his own. Back to hell, asshole! The explosion was so powerful it blew in the windows of buildings for several miles. Anything within half a mile was left in ruins. Where Dylan and his corrupt army had gathered, there was nothing left but a huge, smoking crater. Major Bennings lowered his binoculars. What we sacrifice today, we earn back tomorrow. God bless you, son. He turned to Cohen, who stuck out his hand. Bennings gripped it, but shook his head. We were lucky. Cohen nodded. I'll send out a stand-down order and take some teams out for mop-up. Bennings brushed the plaster dust off his jacket. And now it's all up to the boffins. Chapter 26 Matt sipped his coffee and held Megan's hand. He squeezed it. You okay? She was staring off into the distance, her coffee untouched. She smiled and squeezed back. Yeah, sure, just thinking. Penny for them. She looked dazed. It's like I'm trying to wake up from a nightmare. 
I went to sleep one day, and when I woke, everyone was dead or dying horribly. Brenner, Steinberg, John, Yope, John. And we have no idea whether Kurt made it. She looked at him. Do you think he made it home? Matt smiled. I'm sure he did. The one thing I know about that guy is that he's a survivor. She nodded, not looking convinced. He let go of her hand. I bet he's looking at his gold right now, big as hell and full of life. The small golden idol sat on the edge of the table, its squat form and leering face seeming to cast judgment over the pile of humanity that lay burst open like an overripe fruit on the ground before it. Human life had long since left the flesh, but the bulb-like protrusions continued to grow and pop, releasing millions and millions of larval spore into the air. Kurt was dead, but full of life. Amazing! Hugh scrolled through pages of scientific data. It acts like a super inhibitor. The polygodial read is off the chart. Carla watched as he scrolled to another page, read briefly, and then moved sideways to peer down into a microscope. I love it. It not only inhibits feeding and growth, but even reproduction. It's no wonder it kept the little bastards under control. Hugh lifted his head from the microscope and grinned. Our botanists have performed a regression analysis on the DNA and determined that it is, in effect, an ancient form of chrysanthemum. They say they always suspected that the common form started its life as a vine. He looked back into the small scope again. Makes sense. Chrysanthemums give us most of the truly effective insect control compounds we have today. He scrolled some more. Carla sat beside him, looking at the long chemical compound strings on her screen. She straightened, frowning, confused by the strange chemical composition. Nicotine, permethrin, cypermethrin, and deltamethrin, and a chemical that looks like it could be transfluthrin, but the molecular formula is hybridized. C15, H12, C12, F4, O2, X2. The X2 is something unknown. The computer hasn't ever seen it before. She looked perplexed. Dr. Francis Hewson talked without turning. It's probably another of the axonic poison class. Causes paralysis in the mite by keeping the sodium channels open in the neuronal membranes, effectively creating microscopic perforations in its armor plating. Sodium ions flood in, trigger an action potential, and then our little monster's nerves cannot de-excite. They effectively become paralyzed. Hugh, is it safe to use? Carla asked quietly. Safe? He bobbed his head. Probably. These compounds usually have an extremely low toxicity to mammalian life. Should be okay. But long term... We're talking about introducing an unknown chemical into the environment, possibly on an unprecedented scale. I'd like to see some alpha testing done. Hugh folded his arms and looked at a digital clock on the wall. It was five in the afternoon. Carla, time is against us. It's two minutes to midnight for the world. Indecision is what will kill us all now. They're your words. We'll do testing but we'll proceed on the basis that it's going to work. He shrugged, looking resigned. Do we have a choice? Carla stepped closer to him. Look at me. He stared hard into her face, struggling to maintain eye contact. She knew her skin was grossly bubbled, and she needed strong steroid shots to maintain energy and keep her airways clear, as her body was being converted to a mobile egg case. Don't you think I want this to work more than anyone? We'll do tests, I promise, he said slowly. But I can only meet you halfway. What I can't promise is to do full-scale or long-term testing. I'm sorry. 
She searched his face and then nodded. She knew that at this stage, even a 50% success rate would be preferable to a 100% failure. Okay. She turned back to her screen. I think we can combine it with PB, piperonal butoxide, a known inhibitor of key microsomal oxidase enzymes. PB will prevent the mites enzymes from flushing the pyrethroid from its body, making the toxin even more lethal. She made a fist. These mites are tough, so we need a chemical sledgehammer. Hugh nodded. We can use the high-volume production labs and send the formulae out to every facility still operational in the country. He turned away, his eyes focused inward. But no one will come out to get it, and we certainly don't have the resources to go door to door. We need to hit the Sarcoptes scabii primus hard and all at once. The country will need to bathe in it, shower with it, be flooded by it. He tapped the heavy polymer suit over his chin. And that's just the people. What about the environment? Cattle, horses, dogs, cats, birds. The entire mammalian population, or what's left of it. Hugh paced. And we'll need to get bloomers and potential bloomers to ingest the solution as well. He looked pained. A job of colossal magnitude and little time. Time you don't have, I'm afraid. He walked toward her and took hold of her shoulders. I promise to implement as much testing as time will allow, but we'll need to leap to biological trials today, now. She could hear what he was asking. Testing and doing all at once, huh? He stayed silent. She smiled. Voluntary clinical trial subjects, guinea pigs? He nodded, returning the smile. After all, from what you've told me, you've already bathed in it several times in the crater basin. Hey, what have I got to lose? She shrugged. Ready when you are. Good. The question is, how the hell do we get the entire population to shower with it? Easy. You just said it. Shower them with it. She pointed to the roof. Powderize it and then cloud seed the entire continent. It'll come down in the rain and cover everything, even end up in the drinking water. His eyebrows shot up. See, this is why we needed you here. That might just work. No, it has to work, globally. Wait a minute, globally? Shouldn't we wait and make sure our own environment is unharmed? Hugh shook his head. Can't chance cleansing one environment only to have another one reinfested. Besides, if it works, great, we're dancing in the street. If it doesn't, so what? All we'll give them is red snow come winter. He leaned forward. Carla, it has to work. It will work. It will work, yes. Carla sat down. And besides, it's all we've got. Hugh walked over, bent down, and hugged her, then stepped back to pick up the phone. Bring me down a hundred cc's of the Nero-1 solution, then distribute the formulae on a priority to the labs. He paused for a second. To all of them. I'll be up to walk the department heads through the logistics of dispersal shortly. We're going to seed it. He hung up. Nero-1 solution? She raised her eyebrows. He grinned. What else were we going to call it? It should be named after the intrepid explorer who discovered it. He sat down next to her. Your drink is on its way. First round is on me. They sat in silence for several seconds, before he clicked his fingers and spun in his seat toward her. Hey, I meant to tell you. The genetic analysis boys did some work on the mite genome, and also on the remnants of DNA they could pull from the charred bones of the Archaeopteryx specimen. You know, it was weird. The DNA wasn't what they expected. Hugh pulled a face. Sure, their overall morphology was what was assumed. The creatures were extremely primitive, real primordial remnants from a biological perspective. But here's the thing. The DNA, 
Well, it wasn't a match to the computer extrapolation of what the earliest Saurian bird or Sarcoptes scabii primus design should have looked like. There were traces of modern nucleic acids in the DNA chains for both creatures. He snorted. Must have been contaminated. Carla frowned, and then repeated the word slowly. Contamination? In here? Impossible. Hugh shrugged. Who knows? Doesn't matter now. It was looking like an analytical dead end anyway. Hugh, this is the CDC, one of the most sterile facilities in the world. Just how does something get contaminated in here? What was their theory? Carla sat forward. They had one, but it was ridiculous. He turned to her. That the bird and the parasite weren't original old forms. They were atavisms, random reappearances of evolutionary throwbacks. Carla stood and paced. Atavisms? Both of them? A billion to one chance. That bothers me. She walked with her eyes downcast as her mind worked. Traits reappearing. Traits that had disappeared generations before, that had effectively evolved out of the genetic code. She continued to pace as Hugh watched her. What are you thinking? he asked. I'm thinking that atavism is unbelievably rare. To say it looked to manifest in two specimens that were, species-wise, about as far apart as you can get. That's no coincidence. I've seen human babies born with a vestigial tail, and even heard of whales being sighted with tiny hind legs. It can occur when primitive genes for previously existing phenotypical features are preserved in DNA code. These become expressed through a mutation that either knocks out the overriding genes for the new traits or makes the old traits so dominant that they override the new ones. She coughed and waved him away as he approached. Hugh, it's so rare in one species. For it to spontaneously occur in two is impossible. Something has to trigger it. Some damned thing. She spun, staring at him. Mutagen, she thought. She felt a shock running through her. Yope said it was impossible for the creatures to exist, not just as fantastic individual animals, but all of them together. He didn't think they were from a single point in our history, but vastly different points, stretching for tens of millions of years. One type of animal from the Mesozoic, another from the Jurassic, the Triassic, and so on. She sat down. She started to breathe faster, each lungful harder to suck in and push out. I'm scared. What if the vine... She went to get to her feet and then started to gag. Her mouth opened and closed, but nothing came. Her hands flew to her throat, scratching at it. Carla! Hugh caught her as she fell. Oh, no! Her throat had ballooned shut from the infestation. She blinked, unable to speak, and tried to grab at his arm to make him understand what she feared. The door hissed open, and a suited scientist came in with a beaker of the red fluid. Get me some adrenaline now! Hugh shouted. The scientist went to turn, but Hugh yelled again. Wait! Give me that first! He took the beaker and held it to her lips. Carla, please try and swallow this, please. Just a sip. Carla blinked at him again, knowing that she'd never get the fluid down. Her throat was now so swollen, not an atom of air could pass down it, let alone a drop of the red tincture. She stared at the red beaker. Atavism, mutagen, atavism, her mind screamed, now knowing the secret of the red blooms and the primordial blood jungle. Her vision blurred to blackness. Epilogue, Twelve Months Later The Red Rains, as they came to be known, proved to be enormously successful. The seeding of clouds continued for several months, and every time it rained it fell like blood over the land. Lakes, streams, and rivers ran like a biblical curse, and when faucets were turned on, the red would flow out. 
When the scientists stopped the seeding and the rains returned to normal, people once again ventured out onto the streets. Birds were seen in trees, badgers, mice, and squirrels reappeared in the fields, and horses and cattle were allowed out of quarantine. It was as if the rain had washed away more than just the infestation. Over the weeks and months, the country started to function again. The bodies disappeared, mountains of rubbish were removed, and armies of public officials checked everywhere, from the deepest sewer system to behind the smallest skirting board, for traces of the primordial might. It was the same everywhere. They were still there, but not in the same numbers as before, and only as troublesome as the normal variety of scabies might. The rains had done their job and changed them into something more benign. Ten months after the red rains, the first changes started appearing. Children had thickened brow ridges and low, vaulted craniums. Animals were born bigger or smaller than previously. Slight abnormalities, nothing more. The vines started growing soon after. They climbed walls, tree trunks, and even covered fields. Everything that rose over a foot in height became a platform for their magnificent red-flowered heads. Their poisonous barbs were initially responsible for thousands of deaths, triggering a second nationwide mobilization for eradication. But as fast as they were pulled up, raked under, or burned off, they regrew. In the end, they just became something else to live with. After all, it seemed a small price to pay. The fire engine red flowers were a constant reminder of two things. One, to stay clear. And two, that they would never have a problem with the primordial might again. It was what came next that the scientists said would take some getting used to. Billy threw the ball for Grumpy, the terrier's long hair bouncing up and down as he charged after it. The tough little animal looked like a couple of mop heads strung together, and he growled like a little engine in pursuit of his round, bouncing prey. Dang! Billy had overthrown the ball again, and it had rolled under the far hedge where he wasn't allowed to play. Wait! Heel boy! Grumpy halted at the green barrier, sniffing nervously, then charged in, small teeth bared. Oh, Grumpy, don't go in there. You'll get into trouble. Billy ran to the edge of the garden, pumping his six-year-old legs. He stopped at the border, as all kids were trained to do now. He remembered the rhyme they were taught in school. Wear shoes in the yard, cause the thorns stick hard, and beware of the red or you'll end up dead. He grimaced with indecision. Dad and Mom had told him plenty of times not to take any chances, and he had sure told Grumpy as well. It's just that the dang dog didn't ever listen. This is your fault, Billy said to the hedge. He got down on his knees. There was a whimper, and something rustled in the deep shadows beneath the thick hedge. Grumpy? Grumpy, you come out right now. There was the whimper again. Billy's tone softened. Are you stuck, boy? He looked over his shoulder at the house. No one was watching. He bet he could pull the dog out before anyone even noticed. He reached in. The eight eyes stared dispassionately from atop the fifty-pound body as it slowly lifted itself from the silken-coated bag it had woven over the small, long-haired animal. The tall, hairless creature that now leaned in toward it was much larger, but the spider had plenty of venom left. This one would feed it for days. The glossy, black, muscular body reared up, opening out like an enormous, skeletal hand, finger-sized fangs extended, waiting. Like the scientists said, things would just take some getting used to. Belinda hopes you enjoyed the reading of The First Bird, Episode 3, Terminal Stage. Written by Greg Beck and read by Sean Mangan. 
Our audiobooks are becoming increasingly popular among travelers, families, and people who are on the run. If you really enjoyed this audiobook, please introduce your friends and family to the experience. We're sure they'll love you for it. If you want to hear more about our fabulous range of titles, please visit us online at bolinda.com. Thanks for listening, and remember to always take a Belinda audiobook with you. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.